for now live. Thank you. First off, I'd like to say that uh, Representative Greer, <coughs> Chairman Greer, will not be available to do his report. Um, Chris, I'm sorry, Senator Rothfuss will be doing it, and instead, um, he Mike Greer actually has to go to a funeral today, so he's off. Can we have roll call, please? Uh, Senator Ellis. Here. Senator Hutchings. Here. Senator Landon. Excused. Senator Rothfuss. Here. Representative Brown. Here. Representative Connolly. Here. Representative Flitner. Here. Representative Freeman. Here. Representative Obermuller. Here. Representative Paxton. Here. Representative Peeperinen. Here. Representative Simpson. Here. Co-Chairman Co. Here. And Co-Chairman Northrop. Here. And we have a quorum. Thank you, Josh. All right, you've all had a chance to look at the minutes for the June 4th and 5th meeting. Could I have a motion to approve those minutes if there's no discussion? So moved. So, second. Moved by Freeman, seconded by P. Perinen. All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. And it looks like, P. Perinen, are you voting? Okay, looks like it's uh, in unanimous. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is K-12 education. We're gonna start out with Superintendent Jillian Bailo. Good morning, Superintendent Bailo. Oh, you're muted, Superintendent. Oh, there you go. Okay, am I unmuted? You're good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join your meeting and this time um, not on top of other meetings and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. So I'll jump right in. Um, at your June meeting, my team went over the nuts and bolts of the state education program by discussing three primary components. They discussed state standards, district assessment systems and accountability. And to avoid being redundant, I'll just underscore the importance of all of those issues and use a little bit of time today to talk about some innovative concepts that you might consider as you deliberate on your interim priority too. And these concepts are graduation expectations, competency-based learning, and new methods for teaching and learning, COVID-19 lessons learned, and um, these concepts and the idea of reimagining our state educational system is, uh, of course, as you know, something that's near and dear to my heart. The first time that I formally raised the issue with you was in June 2016 at a joint education committee meeting in Casper. And it was at that meeting, um, if you'll recall, many of you were there. Uh, I was joined by UW computer scientist, Dr. Brian Shader, and we spoke about adding coding and computational uh, thinking to the common core of knowledge. And also we talked about consolidating the common core of skills into the knowledge areas. That meeting, of course, sparked Wyoming's historic computer science initiative, and I hope that now our work and our vision together leads to even more innovation with our educational program. Of course, there are challenges that we face moving the educational program forward, um, and those are not just one or two challenges, those are many, but we have overcome challenges and been solution-based as a state in education for a very long time. So I'll touch on some of those challenges at the very end. But now um, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about each of the three concepts that I mentioned earlier, graduation expectations, competency-based learning, and lessons learned from COVID-19. I wanna just pause and make sure that there aren't any questions before I move on. Any questions for the superintendent? Please move on. Wonderful. Okay, so first is graduation expectations. 
When I think about our graduation expectations and our educational program, I think about it in three buckets, statutory graduation requirements, including the Hathaway scholarship requirements, local district graduation requirements, which oftentimes go above and beyond the statutory requirements. And finally, and this is where the innovation comes in, the profile of a Wyoming graduate. And while we need to consider and, and constantly work on the um, the first two, the bulk of our immediate work really rests with the profile of a Wyoming graduate. The State Board of Education has recognized the importance of this work and is really leading our state discussion on this topic. And you'll hear from State Board Chair Ryan Furman on this after I am done this morning. And it's been really excited to partner with uh, Chairman Furman and the board on this important work. And it's really only when we carefully contemplate and collectively determine what the profile of a graduate looks like for a Wyoming student. And that allows us to reimagine the entire state educational program. So you're probably wondering what is a profile of a graduate? And let me give you an example of how it works. Um, largely right now graduation requirements are based on achievements, grades, credits, seat time, etc. A profile of a graduate considers characteristics and skills that are accomplished in addition to achieve the, the traditional achievement. So in Utah, the portrait of a graduate embodies key characteristics that students should possess after a K-12 education. The portrait isn't just limited to achievement in high school classes, and it includes attributes such as work ethic and honesty throughout a school career. And those ne can't necessarily be quantified, but they can certainly be um, demonstrated in a number of ways throughout a child's career. In Virginia, citizenship is a key component of the profile of a graduate, and it requires that students dem demonstrate a commitment to service and their civic responsibility. And finally, Kentucky's profile of a graduate has an emphasis on innovation and exploration through CTE courses. There are many states that have gone toward a profile of a graduate, seeing as it as a more encompassing way to, um, to capture a, the, the successes in a student's education experience. The State Board has worked with consultants who have done this work in other states, and I'm really pleased with the discussion so far and really enthused about the opportunities that Wyoming has to think carefully about a profile of a Wyoming graduate. The second, is, uh, the second concept is competency-based learning. And again, you're probably wondering what in the world is that? And so I'll start with just saying it's a 21st century uh, style or um, skill. And when we think about 21st century learning, we quickly think about technology. Today's learners, however, learn in addition to using technology better, they learn more efficiently just in general. And it's not just the result of technology. We've known for a long time that taking breaks from things like lectures, studying, sitting, etc., is a good thing for all of us. And today we have a generation of learners who would rather learn by video than by book. That same group that's in our schools, Generation Z, still has the very same drive and curiosity to learn and to succeed, but with a shorter attention span and many more learning tools at their fingertips. And if any of you have watched kids swipe through TikTok, uh, you know exactly what I mean. Um, they, they garner a lot in just a few seconds. As a state, our education system and the basket of goods should really move toward this more competency-based learning. Some of our Wyoming schools, and especially in our CTE programs, have already moved in this direction. And although it's not well aligned to the basket of goods, our schools recognize that it's the way that we need to move with some of our education programs. So in essence, a competency-based education system transitions away from required student seat time and it allows students to progress and demonstrate mastery of what they learn as they are ready to demonstrate it. A competency-based education system emphasizes essential learnings with opportunities for a deeper dive into areas of interest to the student.
In other words, they learn what they need to and they, they progress in their education on what's of interest to them in that subject area. Finally, a competency-based education takes place in more than just a classroom and more than just a brick and mortar environment. It may be blended, it may be online, and it may be project-based in the workplace or in our community. There are some statutory changes that would help usher in competency-based learning for more schools. And I'll mention those along with the challenges that I'll just quickly touch on at the end. Rule changes in our content and performance standards are already underway that help educators determine what essential learnings are, which is one key or one foundation, one underpinning to competency-based learning. And as I noted, some school districts are already offering some competency-based learning opportunities, despite that it's misaligned with our basket of goods and our model. So moving on to the third concept, and that is COVID-19 and some of the lessons we learned. Um, as you know, we've all uh, shared this experience and there are many more lessons to learn in many areas going forward. But in education, we have long talked about how the system needs a disruption in order for it to change. Uh, we talk about all of these great things that we could do and talk about how we can get them done and really grapple with that. That disruption came, like it or not, on March 15th. And overnight, we saw Wyoming teachers pick up and move forward with blended learning, flipped classrooms, virtual learning, remote learning. Uh, divide, that we, we saw school districts uh, scramble to make sure that devices were in the hands of family and kids. We worked on broadband ex expansion and internet access. We focused on essential learnings versus getting through all the standards and all the curriculum by May. And we focused really on a competency-based learning. All of these visionary education concepts became our reality on March 15th. And while we're all anxious for a post COVID world, we should not be hasty to return our schools to the way they were. In fact, at this point, that would be irresponsible. Now is the time when we get to make a choice. Do we use COVID-19 as a reason not to improve and to go back to normal for years to come? Or do we use COVID-19 as the disruption that we've all waited for as a catapult to examine and contemplate what worked well and keep it and memorialize what wasn't working well in the first place? We didn't write statute, rule, or guidance with a pandemic in mind, and I'd like to pause here and just thank you for your careful deliberation on statute because it allowed us along with our rules and policy and practice in school districts to really find our way through what some days felt like a bit of a minefield during COVID-19. Our teachers didn't start their school year last year with a pandemic in mind, yet that's exactly where we ended. And we fit statute and rule into a pandemic box. And um, we all scrambled to provide a quality remote education for our kids. And ladies and gentlemen um, of the committee, I just hope that you take many opportunities over the next weeks and months to visit with teachers and principals and students in your House and Senate districts about their experiences last spring, because every teacher leveraged technology better. Every teacher provided more opportunities for students to show mastery and every teacher reflected on the experience that they had and is a different professional today because of it. Since March, I've, I've been reflecting on this. And I think one thing that I keep coming back to is this, under No Child Left Behind and our current education framework, we really worked to create a prescribed system that every child fits inside. And today we know better, but it's been really tough to change a system. The Every Student Succeed, Succeeds Act placed the responsibility of preparing all students for college or career squarely on us at the state level, each one of us today. And COVID-19 has illuminated that while we made changes to our system under Every Student Succeeds, we haven't gone far enough. We have expected kids to still fit inside of our public education system. And during COVID-19, though it was challenging, we adjusted our system to meet the needs of students. So how do we hold on to that? How do we leverage that? And how do we make it better? 
So those are the concepts that I wanted to share with you today. And I'll just quickly talk about some of the challenges and I'll start with the challenges that are really statutory challenges that I think could be addressed by this committee and by the legislature uh, in 2021 and um, during the interim still in 2020. Number one is seat time requirements. And there are several rules and statutes that relate to that that I'm happy to supply to this committee through a memo or in writing as follow up. The second challenge is the funding mechanisms and that really uh, is around school operations for 185 days and 175 days uh, for uh, students. That has some wiggle room that we were able to exercise during the pandemic, but again, it really doesn't fit the model of a competency-based education or a more fluid education that we really need to think about today. Already as a state at the local level, at the state level, and, um, and really at the national level, we're thinking differently about teacher training. We're thinking differently about the cultural shifts that have taken place as a result of the pandemic and as a result of other things moving forward, such as in the, the assessment culture. We think about the fidelity of the changes. If we're going to make changes, how do we make them sustainable? And then of course, Wyoming isn't alone. However, we are perhaps in a more dire situation with our funding, but funding uncertainty exists across the nation and of course in Wyoming. So I wanna stop there. And again, I wanna thank the committee for your time this morning um, and just indulging me, uh, inviting me to share a little bit more about the basket of goods and a little bit, about, a little bit more about some innovative concepts that I could see um, moving at Wyoming education forward, not only into the 21st century, but to keep us competitive and keep us as the high quality and top notch public education system that they are. And at Mr. Chairman, um, I would stand for any questions or additional comments that might spur or um, just uh, lead to a more robust conversation in our state and among this committee. Does anybody have a question for Superintendent Gillian? Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Madam Superintendent, just a couple of quick questions. Um, the first one that you, you just kind of finished up with, I wanna piggyback off of you said, if you have some ideas of what we can do with the basket of goods to change it, you know, and um, you and I and, and many others have gone to the green books and we've looked at what the basket of goods actually entails. And, you know, every time we open up that green books, we look at that, and we say, we want to figure out where we can, where we can reduce what we can do to reduce the cost. And every time it turns out that there's just not much left in that basket that anybody is willing to cut because we all see those as um, needed, you know, a necessity in what you'll call the profile of the graduate. So I'd be a little interested, number one, off of what you mean by um, legislatively, um, what we can do to change the basket of goods to be more reflective of what you consider to ma match this profile. Uh, and then second of all, I would be kind of curious to see, you know, going through the letter with, uh, with Ryan Furman here, it shows one of the things that stuck out to me, and I, we can ask him as well, but one of the things that stuck out to me was it says that the legislature needs to be more clear on what we want from high school graduates. And while I understand that, I think it's pretty clear what we have put forward is, it, honestly, in my opinion, is the Hathaway scholarship. So maybe if you could explain your position on that, and then I'll ask uh, Ryan Furman as well, what his position is on what, they, what you guys mean when we need to have a clearer understanding of what a high school graduate needs uh, via statute. Great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative Brown. Um, just to, to think about, I, I guess when we think about the basket of goods, uh, sometimes we tend to limit ourselves on those common core of skills and knowledge, but the basket of goods is much more robust than that. And um, so, so it really is the little green book and um, lots of sections therein. So some of the question or some of the um, areas where I think that we could maybe work together uh, to think legislatively about changes, first of all, include truncating the, the common core of skills and knowledge and um, seat time, of course, and days in class. Uh, those are some legislative places within the basket of goods and within in the statute that we could look. But um, 
you know, and 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 I, I think that this warrants a lot uh, more discussion by some of the various groups, including this committee, including the state board, and including many other organizations that are listening to this meeting about, you know, March 15th, we asked every school in Wyoming to focus on essential learnings. And there were a lot of challenges that were associated with that. And there was, um, there were a lot of, of uh, of failures and, and some successes as well. And I think what we all saw was that when we focused on essential learnings and when we were able to double down on learning opportunities that interested kids, we saw some pretty great, uh, great things like take place in the classroom. And I'm gonna put that in air quotes because it was virtual and remote for most kids. But if we can somehow harness that and continue to talk about that, and think, you know, and the work is already underway with the state state board of education in um, rethinking the content and performance standards, the um, the PLDs or the descriptors that go along with that, and really kind of parsing out what are the essential learnings that every student needs to know before going on, and where are the places where we can create more opportunity for local control and um, for for opportunities for individualized opportunities for students. Now, does that equate to savings for, um, for the education system? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I, I, I think that that is something that other people uh, who, are, who, are, who are more in the know of, of a school or a district budget would be able to better answer. But can we pare down the basket of goods without losing anything? Um, I, I think that discussion continues to be at the burner. And I think some of the work is already underway to work to, um, to, uh, to have that conversation at the local level and think about these, continue thinking about the essential learnings. You also asked about graduation standards and the way that I understand it from this group and from other legislators is that statutorily the floor is set. It's up to school districts to create the ceiling. What I think we're considering with the, um, the profile of a graduate, graduate is, is really um, sort of expanding the, the dance floor, if you will, to include um, some, some opportunities for students to demonstrate uh, different skills and, and characteristics that maybe can't be measured by seat time, by test scores, or by credit hours. And, um, you know, again, does that equate to a change in the Hathaway scholarship? I'm not sure that it does. I think that there are some conversations to be had about the ACT and about Carnegie units and seat time, et cetera, that may affect or may cause us to rethink um, the Hathaway scholarship, uh, but it's not going to look a whole lot different from the way that we've continued to refine and think about the Hathaway scholarship. And, um, and that work is really ongoing. What's innovative now is the conversation in the state led by the state board about the profile of a graduate, which really expands beyond the black and white, this is what a graduate looks like, to more of this is what we want our graduates to be able to demonstrate. These are the characteristics that we want them to embody. And these are the achievements that we want them to have under the, their belt before moving to a career or on to college. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Madam Superintendent, I, I wanted to follow up on one of the things that you said in answer to Representative Brown's question um, about the basket of goods, where in there you said that the we're looking to see if, if we can cut down on the basket of goods without losing anything, <laughs> was what you said. And I'm, I'm trying to process that. And if, if you're actually cutting down on the basket of goods in a way that would save money, resources, or anything else, I don't see how it would be possible to not lose anything. And if you do it in such a way that you haven't lost anything, I guess I would say, what's the purpose of that? Uh, you know, what have you really done? And, and why would we cut the basket of goods if it has no effect? Um, it, it seems like there's a little bit of a paradox there. So I wanted to know if you could explain that. Sure, um, Mr. Chairman and Senator Rothfuss, thanks for that opportunity. And that's really um, uh, maybe more of a debate than something that warrants a, um, a simple answer, but I will say this. Uh, I think that if, if we're being incredibly realistic about the basket of goods and about our content and performance standards as they are now, 
There is too much for one student to learn, too much for one teacher to teach. Does that mean that everything is, and too much for one assessment to assess? So um, I think that we just need to be cognizant of the basket of goods cannot hold everything. And so what is it? What are the essential learnings? Just like last spring, we had to ask teachers to focus on what are the skills that move kids forward, that prepare them to learn the next thing. And, and without kind of um, digging a hole for a debate, um, I, I want to just say that this is something that should be contemplated and debated at its very core. We've set a, a dance floor or a floor for graduation requirements. We've set a ceiling for standards. And so, where, where is there a balance in there? Do we focus on essential learnings or do we continue to be very comprehensive with our, um, with our standards and our content and performance standards? And perhaps that's, uh, you know, again, that's, that work is already underway to some extent with the state board and um, the work on the rules and the, the, the PLDs, the descriptors within the content and performance standards that help to sort of um, parse out those essential learnings. But I think that that's a, a concept that, that this committee ought to also consider. And um, I'm not saying that math should go away, but I do still, you know, or, or anything like that. Uh, but I do still think that there is some room to have a discussion about the basket of goods and to consolidate the, um, the skills and knowledge into one and rethink the basket of goods as more of the dance floor and not the seat. Feeling. I hope that helps. It's not really an answer, Senator, but um, but hopefully it 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 helps kind of spur some some more um, thought into uh, what you, the, the enormous task that you all have and that we will follow up on uh, as a department, as a state board, and as other organizations in the state. Thank you, Superintendent. Representative Simpson had a question. Then we'll go to Representative Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent Bailo, what you've described to us today about your vision of the future and how we adjust the process and the way we educate our kids, I think is absolutely spot on. Thank you very much for your vision. <clears throat> As a member of this committee, I want you to know that I'm supportive of adjusting our state statutes wherever we can to, to meet your vision. I think you're exactly right on. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Simpson. Go ahead, Representative Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Superintendent Bailo, thanks for being here and your comments. Um, I must admit, I was a little confused over kind of what was a very declarative statement um, that you had, which was that in, in reference to the basket of goods, that it's too much. And I was thinking, well, what's the metric for saying that it's too much? Obviously it's not in terms of it's been there for decades and our schools have offered those classes and our students have graduated with that basket. And so I'm not sure what it's too much means. And then I'm thinking about what are the metrics that we would be looking at, right? Is it graduation rate? Is it too much for graduation? I mean, our graduation rate has been inching up the way we want. Is it too much for success on NAEP? And the reality is, as we kind of learned last time or reiterated that we're doing great in terms of our NAEP scores in relation to other states. So what did you mean by it's too much? Because we're doing it and it seems to be successful. Ah. Right. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Connolly, uh, thank you. And and I think taken in in context, maybe that is not um, quite the declarative statement that um, that it was. And so I guess I'd like to to maybe just go back and say that the basket of goods, along with the the sets of standards. Uh, content and performance standards that go with the basket of goods may be too much for one student to learn or achieve through their career. Um, it's definitely too much 
to be assessed. Uh, we take bits and pieces from the content and performance standards to assess on our statewide assessment and the state and, and assess on our on the local level as well. Um, I think the declarative comes in, uh, you know, is is this is this providing enough opportunity for teachers, for schools, for districts to make local determinations about, or is it not? Now, in 2016, when I, uh, when Dr. Shader from UW and I talked initially about, actually it was computer science financial literacy in the basket of goods, we made recommendations around computer science and computational thinking. That was the first significant change to the basket of goods since its inception uh, to those content and performance standards or the, the skills and the knowledge. Um, and I also made the recommendation that um, that PE health and wellness be truncated, that the um, skills be truncated or consolidated or blended into the knowledge areas and that civics and social studies be combined. So there are a couple of, of concrete areas where we could consolidate the basket of goods. And maybe that's semantics, but it isn't if we have a deliberative process about it. And if we follow up as a state board and as a state with, um, with some, some intentional decisions to, uh, to reduce or make that uh, realistic and relevant for every Wyoming student. So again, I'm not sure that that's a, a, an, an answer that you can just give black and white to convince you one way or another, but I put it out there really as, as a matter of contemplation for, um, for our state and for um, really for this committee and other, other organizations that are listening in to continue. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think that the phrase I've heard the most sitting on this committee is the plate is full. And when we had the computer science discussion, it, it was, nope, we can't ever change the basket because the day is already too much. And I so I've heard that a lot. And so I'm a little curious why that sounds like a surprise. So I guess um, I'm really encouraged by your discussion about rethinking seat time. Um, and I'm wondering if school districts are monitoring how much time like some of our virtual learners and blended learners are actually required to be, or how much actual time they're sitting there doing work. I can tell you anecdotally for my friends that are doing uh, virtual right now, um, my one friend, her daughter was done by noon and they spent the rest of the afternoon together. And so it does get you rethinking um, the seat time model. So I just want to learn more about, is there another state that's really kind of nailing it with their funding model and their their model in general, because I, I do think that um, we're learning a lot and I think we can do a lot more and a lot better. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, thanks for those comments. And, um, you know, typically if uh, the, the, the question or the comment, the plate is full, uh, comes my way, um, my, my question back is whose plate is full? Uh, and to Representative Connolly's point, uh, maybe it's not the students because they're doing it. But I think if you ask teachers um, and, and school districts if the plate is full, it is. So are there some places where we can make sure that we keep a student's experience robust and keep teachers really focused on the essential learnings and providing opportunities for additional learning within an educational program? And I think that's one of the wonderful things about rethinking and one of the lessons learned uh, from COVID-19, but it's one of the wonderful things about rethinking um, seat time. And, uh, and, and you're absolutely right, especially if a child is done by one and the afternoon is spent doing some kind of experiential education or focused in on what a student or a child is passionate about, whether that's riding horses or going out um, on the, you know, on the tractor with grandpa or dad, or whether it's spending time with with mom, uh, you know, doing at, at, at her job or uh, doing some other kind of 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 learning. Um, so I think that there are a lot of opportunities, and every single state that I know of is having this very conversation uh, right now uh, as a result of COVID nineteen and as a result of this disruption that we've undergone. So do other states have it nailed with their funding model or with their education system? I'm not sure that we're there yet. 
Uh, but but I think uh, we have some really great examples right here in the Cowboy State of teachers that uh, that leveraged the learning opportunities of families that supported those moments and of schools that um, that permitted them and focused on their essential learnings, not getting through every single thing. Thank you, Representative. Or I'm sorry, Superintendent Bailo. So I have a question about seat time. You're, you're talking about you might have some recommendations for seat time and how do you account for students that, that are in and out and in actual learning versus those that are sitting there for the whole day trying to figure it out? I mean, every student doesn't learn at the same pace. Uh, Chairman Northrup, and um, I, a great question, and, and luckily uh, you all have solved that to a certain extent with virtual education statute and, um, and the follow-up rules that, that the department has, has uh, promulgated around virtual education, and we found some ways to um, really deal with that. Uh, I think the question before us is, are we going to be black and white about what that looks like, or are we going to be more competency-based and say, you know what, it matters less how much time they were on Zoom or how much time they spent in a classroom, and it matters more that they were able to demonstrate uh, skills and, um, and knowledge in certain ways. Um, I'm, I'm just going to share, you know, one, one quick story uh, I was visiting with actually a, a, he, he invented a video game or a console or I'm not sure what, but he was a 25 year old millionaire. And I asked him, what about your schooling prepared you or what about your schooling prompted you, inspired you, whatever, to do what you do? And he said, well, I was homeschooled, not that that's any ding against a public school. He said, but what I did was I did what I had to do to move forward and I focused all the rest of my time on what I was passionate about, which was computer science, which was math, which was science. And, um, and those are maybe the opportunities that we could look for in a competency-based learning system and in, um, and in the basket of goods uh, and as we rethink seat time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent, on the competency-based learning, uh, we know that New Hampshire basically switched as much as they could to a competency-based learning model and, and is still trying to you know, finalize that switch. Uh, so we should have some data and, and we should be able to see from their perspective what was and was not successful. Uh, do we have any good reports? Do we, do we have any good indicators? Um, I, I know that they haven't switched back to my knowledge, so they, they, they can't think it was a failure, but did, have they judged it to be a full success or are there some lesson learns there, lessons learned there? Anything that we can look at with regard to their experience? Chairman Northrop, Senator Rothfuss, um, I am happy to reach out to the state chief in New Hampshire and um, our favorite psychometrician in New Hampshire to uh, look for some data and some reporting on that. Uh, you know, there will be reporting um, in lots of different areas, and maybe I can provide this this committee with uh, several points of data on New Hampshire. Um, you know, uh, to um, Senator Ellis's question about funding models that sort of support the competency-based learning. I think that's a really compelling question as well. And, um, and I'm not sure that, that there is data to support all of that, but I'm happy to uh, sort of dig, it, dig into that and see what I can find. Mr. Chairman and Superintendent, yeah, I think um, it's Scott Marion, and for, for those that aren't familiar with the fact that Scott's been heavily involved with that. Um, it, I think I would like to hear more and, and maybe we can uh, maybe we can pull Scott in. He seems to always be happy to to join us maybe virtually this time um, to learn a little bit more about their experience and, and you know, what's the good, what's the bad, what are the lessons learned? I, I think that would be useful for the committee. Thank you, Superintendent. Representative Freeman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the first time in 43 years that I haven't gone to school as a professional. It's like, what do I do? And 43 years ago, I got a job at an alternative school and I went to the first staff meeting and the, the conversation that lasted a half a day is what does a high school student look like, graduate look like? And um, 
and, and it was an ongoing conversation for the next 23 years that I stayed in that, that institution. Uh, seat time sucks. Uh, I don't know any better way of saying that because it, it inhibited us as professionals and students uh, to get the, the, uh, the, uh, the degree that they needed to go forward. And, but it's, it's connected to funding. And I think that that's going to be the big thing is how do you disconnect that from, from the funding uh, to where that you can allow uh, innovative students and teachers to, uh, to do the best that they can. Uh, I've always been um, warm, but not hot on competency. I think that it, it has a, a place in, in, it's a tool in our toolbox and that we should use it. And, and to give you some, some of the, uh, an example of why I'm, I'm kind of hesitant on it is I had a, a student named Charlie who, who came to us and he was 17 and he'd been out of school for a while. And before that, he burned every bridge in the traditional schools that he could. He was brilliant and, um, and he had a personality that I immediately attached to. Um, when he came to us, he was a manager of a branch of a national chain in, in Rock Springs. And it was a large store and it was the highest performing store in in the, in the region. Um, he knew math. He knew how to uh, uh, use his floor space to come up with the most return on what was going on there. He, he knew supervision. He was supervising, I don't remember, but probably about 20 different people. He understood salaries so that he could look and see how, how they were going to, to um, uh, make it to where that he got a bigger bonus because if he had larger sales and, and more profitability, the bigger his bonus was. He, he was just an extraordinary person, but he wasn't ready for the next class in college. He wasn't ready to where that he could go on and get a, get a degree to where that he could advance. He didn't do the GED and he came to us because they wouldn't accept a GED. So he had to come to us to get a high school diploma. So it was a really kind of interesting paradox that what was there. And we were, we were probably breaking the law, but we found a way to get him to, get him, to accelerate him to where he could get his degree. You contrast that with a person who's a super student and I've had my share of those, much smarter than I will ever be. You know, they can, no class that I could put up in front of them was a challenge to them. They, they could go much further and faster than what I could, but they weren't ready for life. They didn't understand what Charlie did for inventory or, or um, uh, you know, the amount of what, uh, what that floor space could come up there. So there's got to be some sort of flexibility for, for uh, schools and school districts to kind of um, accept competency and not get dinged by it by the, uh, by the, uh, the funding formula. You know, one of the things that has come up a lot is, um, is civics. Uh, I'm a social studies teacher and I taught history, I taught government and all that other kind of stuff. And yet what happens is, is I taught a lot and, and this comes to, uh, uh, comes to me in two phone calls that I've received in the last uh, four months from former students that asked me how to explain the primary system and how that they're going to be involved in this. And these are my exceptional students. They did well on the tests that I came up with, but they still didn't understand the system. Some sort of experiential education to where that they're involved in the system, to where that they understand would have reinforced what I taught. I taught what I was supposed to. They, they, they passed the tests that they were supposed to, 
but it didn't become part of their core. Um, I liked and I didn't like the superintendent's edu uh, answer on virtual education that allows some flexibility. Virtual education is, is, is very good for a certain part of the population. And, and I think we have to realize that. The flip side of that is there are people like me that, that, um, that need a classroom, that need to have the interaction. In fact, one of my favorite um, uh, expressions is, is I learned more in the hallway and in the, in the professor's uh, office than I ever did in the classroom because there I could internalize what was going on. So I don't want us to, to, to be dependent on virtual education for the only answer for flexibility. And, and that's just my warning. The other thing that has come, and I've been on this committee for 10 years, is um, financial um, a competency, for lack of a better word. Um, when we were having that discussion 43 years ago, you know, most of our students were in, in the real world. They were, they were living on their own. They were buying cars and that kind of stuff. They had no idea about banking. They had no idea of what interest was. They had no idea of having a budget on how to, how to uh, uh, live beyond paycheck to paycheck. You know? And it's my experience in 43 years is we never came up with a requirement that's, that students have that kind of information to go forward. But I think that that's part of what a high school graduate has, that they would be ready to go out and, and to, to do that, that they would understand what a, how to buy a house and, and, and the experiences on that and how to budget and stuff. But it's nothing, we, we don't have any of that. And as a legislator, I've probably been bit by that, by that dog about four or five times. And I understand, and it should be part of that. And if you're going forward on what a high school graduate is, I hope you make more progress in the next 43 years than what I did in the 43 years that I was in the, in the profession. And it's not that the people that I worked with weren't working hard. The system was set up to where it was seat time. Mm -hmm. It was tests. It was, it was that kind of stuff. And we're going to have to break free, free from that. But on the flip side of that, as I have seen people who have granted credits where students hadn't learned at all. So you can't lose accountability. So that's my, my uh, rant for today. But I, I like the idea that we're, we're having this discussion as a state, because I would bet that every school in the in, every high school in the state of Wyoming has had that that discussion many, many, many times. So do school boards. And uh, we're the problem. It's, it's how we fund schools and, uh, okay, and what we expect for our graduates. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to tip my hat and thank Representative Freeman for his educational leadership and so much. And I think it will continue to be a, a, a risk um, that this committee and many others take to uh, separate the conversation about uh, competency-based learning, virtual education, uh, et cetera, from funding. Uh, but you have to decouple those for the, the purposes of doing what's best for kids. And part of the profile of a graduate and part of, of what makes that maybe successful in Wyoming is that it is deliberative uh, with this group and many others to come come forth what's, with what's best for every student. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again, Representative. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for Superintendent Balo? If not, we'll move on to our discussion with the State Board of Education, Diana Clapp and Ryan Fearman. You guys want to take it away? Who's up first? Good morning, Diana. Good morning. I want to make sure you can hear me on the mic. Diana is muted. There we go. And now you're back. There you go. And Ryan, uh, I can hear you. Okay, very good. 
So I just want to start by uh, saying good morning, uh, co-chairman and committee members. I am, of course, Ryan Furman, chairman of the State Board of Education, and in my day job, uh, wearing this mask every day as we've started back to uh, junior high here in Sheridan. And uh, I'm excited. I really enjoyed listening in on that conversation uh, and partnering with, with Superintendent Balo on, on what this all means, because we are in this really unique situation right now. And it's the perfect storm in a lot of ways, and it's also a unique opportunity. But before I get into talking about our work with Profile of a Graduate, I have the unique privilege of introducing our new State Board Coordinator, Dr. Diana Clapp. Uh, Dr. Diana Clapp is deeply qualified to serve the board. So just a quick summary, UW graduate, has called Fremont County home for 35 years, has raised three children, all who have gone through the K-12 system here in our state. She has been a teacher, a principal, curriculum director, and for the past 17 years, one of the most innovative small rural district superintendents, superintendent of Fremont number six. And so we are excited and eager to have that perspective inform the work of the board, as well as just rely on her vast knowledge and experience. And um, it's already been great to work with her for the past kind of month and a half, really. And I look forward to all that she has to offer as she continues to serve her state and her support of education. And so that leads me into kind of one of the first tasks we had Dr. Clapp work on jointly with Dr. Saxe was just a review of all the statutes that pertain to the State Board of Education. Uh, it was, in all honesty, something that was quite long overdue. In fact, uh, State Statute 21-304, I believe it's subsection C is how you, you say that, specifically directs the state board to perform an ongoing review of state board duties prescribed by law and then make recommendations to the legislature about those duties. So that is a topic that was a part of our board retreat and it's one that is ongoing. I mentioned that uh, not only to just give you a heads up that we might have some recommendations coming your way in the not too distant future, but also it reminded us of state statute, which re directs the State Board of Education to establish statewide goals for Wyoming public education. Uh, and this of course ties directly into our task on clarifying graduation standards and is the focus of the remainder of my presentation. So as I described in my letter, we are just in the beginning initial phases of this work. We started by gathering just some background information from local, regional, and national experts. In June, we heard from Dr. Brent Pickett-Dean of the University of Wyoming at Casper College and heard about a little bit of a misalignment between remediation rates and our graduating seniors. Uh, those are the students who, of course, have to take remedial courses as freshmen in college. We also heard from Susan Patrick, a former director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. And, and she simply kind of opened our eyes to what is a profile of a graduate by sharing some of those samples from around the country. So from kind of that initial conversation in June, we decided to focus our July retreat uh, largely on diving into this idea of what is a profile of a graduate. And we had Gretchen Morgan, who was formerly of the Colorado Department of Education, uh, who helped spearhead some of their innovation around their uh, graduation standards, kind of lead us deeper into looking at those samples and guiding our conversation on what is the next step for the board. And that of course was in July and we had a really robust conversation. And I would, would like to share just some of our takeaways that as a board, as we move forward, these are kind of our discussion points that we will use to guide the work going forward in terms of the next steps for these conversations. So first, we want to lead this conversation about what we as a state want our education system to produce. Um, we should be deeply proud of what we currently have, absolutely. Um, but ultimately, we, we want to fully recognize that the end of this is to produce citizens because we're required to think about college and career and technical education. Some of our, our students are headed to the military, but every single graduate 
uh, needs to be ready to assume the responsibility of citizenship. And so that's something that we, we noted. Second, the state board we feel is uniquely suited to lead this conversation from the very appointed nature of our board. We uh, have perspectives all across the state and from all levels of education, as well as strong voices from the business community that are baked into these conversations. But we also recognize that this is a fantastic opportunity to strengthen the communication in the interdependence with all of the various stakeholders around our state, from business leaders to uh, our local boards. Uh, Superintendent Bailiff spoke about this, and this was something that came up again and again. There is a importance on these soft skills, also called 21st century skills, which probably need a new name now that it's 2020, uh, or employability skills if you're a business owner, which is essentially what is the, what are the behaviors that successful adults need to be successful as, as workers and, and as citizens. Right now, our current accountability model does not provide a good way to measure these. And as a result, they're not always a focus in our classrooms because we're focused on the content and performance standards. The board also um, recognizes that the graduation standards that we hope come out of this work will be pivotal in providing clarity to the many facets of the K-12 system, such as, and, and here's what I was referring to in my, my letter, when we write our performance standards, do we just write a lot of them or using our profile of a graduate, our ideal, what are the essential learnings that we need to focus and ensure our students are learning? Uh, we also recognize that right now in our state, there is already variation in graduation standards, right? And I, Superintendent Bailo referred to the dance floor and the ceiling. And so right now we have different districts dancing in different ways, and there are some great opportunities to learn from our local districts. Uh, they have already done a lot of thinking around what they want to produce in their local K-12 system. And we, as the state board, want to begin our state process by learning and working with them. And that, of course, means we need to deepen or establish new partnerships. We need to expand trust and uh, collectively build the understanding across the state. And we've already started some work with that. We, as a state board, are, are working a little bit closer with the department, I feel, and also with uh, WSBA to, to have our initial conversations around this topic. And then finally, as a state board, we recognized this is an interesting time to have this essential conversation with a pandemic and funding challenges. We know that we need to proceed carefully and patiently but also we need to use the opportunity that has been, uh, that is here before us to, to revamp or improve our system. So these are the kind of the, the conversations, I'm, I'm summarizing the conversations that we had collectively as a board, but we're taking those and they're guiding our next steps. We did not meet in August as many of us are, are here getting our schools back and running under these new conditions. Um, but we are excited to resume the conversation and ultimately in partnership, I wanna say that word again, in partnership craft graduation standards that, that serve the state. So right now we have kind of sketched out four phases, as I hold up five fingers, four phases. The first one is we're just drafting the roadmap right now, uh, finding our stakeholders that want to join us on this journey in our conversations. Um, like I mentioned, we're, we're, I've already reached out to SBE and uh, WASA, we're excited that the University of Wyoming has a new appointed member to our board, Dr. Rush, Dean of Education. Um, and we have now a business committee who is reaching out already to our, our businesses around the state to bring them into the conversation earlier for the state board work. So that's our pre-phase. And then the next step is what, what I'm calling finding the foundation, which is what exists now. Um, in our packet, we provided some of the early work, which was this, handout on what does it mean to be a Wyoming graduate, which succinctly lists, you know, the basket of goods plus the skills plus grad requirements, plus anything that's locally done, which is where you get your diploma. And then influencing that strongly is all of the Hathaway success criteria. And so 
this is our foundation right now. This is our dance floor, as it were. Um, so that's that's part of just finding the foundation. We also want to hear from our local districts on on what they are doing when they answer the question, what do you want to ensure that your high school seniors leave your system knowing and being able to do? After we have that work done, then we'll be producing a profile, which is taking all of those conversations and really as a state articulating what we wanna produce from our K-12 system, what's working and, and what can we improve on? And then ultimately to get to goal three, which is setting the standards uh, putting in graduation standards that hopefully will then go back and provide clarity to the work that, that the state board continually does involving standards and accountability. There are some pitfalls that we are looking out for. Obviously, capacity right now for a lot of people is, is pretty maxed out with COVID and, and all of the funding conversations. I'm glad the state board of education um, doesn't have to deal with funding. And I, I leave that to your expertise to, to solve that riddle for, for us. Um, but we are encouraged to lead that conversation for producing uh, Wyoming, Wyoming graduates. Um, just personally, I have a, a high school junior and a high school sophomore and a seventh grader. So this is more than just a theoretical conversation. This is really hits me home as a, as a father. What do I want? my kids to leave our system with. Hopefully this process will bring clarity and efficiency to the system and ultimately provide, which again, in our, our statute review, I'll just read a little bit of statute to you, provide students an opportunity to acquire sufficient knowledge and skills at a minimum to enter the University of Wyoming and Wyoming Community Colleges to prepare students for the job market or post-secondary vocational and technical training and to achieve the general purposes of education that equips students for their role as a citizen and participant in the political system and to have the opportunity to compete both intellectually and economically in our society. Uh, there couldn't be anything more important for the State Board of Education to focus our time on even in these exceedingly difficult times. And with that, I stand for questions regarding our work on profile of a graduate. Questions for Ryan? Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ryan, thank you for, for all your hard work on this. I know there's a, uh, a ton of discussion and a lot of, lot of long days that you guys went through to get to this point. So I appreciate the background and the information on this. Um, two quick questions. Uh, yeah. Number one is the same question that I had for the superintendent, and that is, I, I guess we've set what I believe to be a pretty clear expectation uh, statutorily for right. what our expectation for a high school graduate is. And it seems to me that that floor um, is, and maybe let me rephrase my question. Um, do you guys, is the state board not seeing that as sufficient any longer? I think there's there's two parts to that where I think there's opportunity. Uh, the first part is is when I talk about clarity, and Superintendent Bailo spoke about this. Is as a former teacher, we I have all of these standards, right? And I have the physics of of time, and so I either can focus on teaching all of them and go galloping through all the standards, or I can focus on ensuring students are learning them. And to do that, I can't give equal time to all of those standards, right? If all of the standards are important, then essentially none of them are. And so the first thing that the state board has done with computer science is, right, adding this new basket of good, asking to the basket of good is, was to send back this wish list of good stuff and okay, that ensures that teachers might, might cover that quickly, but if we want our students to master computer science, what do they essentially have to be able to demonstrate they've learned? And so that's what I mean by providing that clarity so that every student across the state, it's not left up to individual teachers to decide on what they think is important. We let our standards writing team, the experts, focus that attention for those teachers and, and help them reach that. So 
that's true for computer science and that's really true for all of our standards. And, and it's really that, that journey that a lot of schools have been on with the PLC framework is what do we want our students to know and be able to do? We've got to decide that up first, right? And then um, the second part, I think, goes back to those essential skills. Right now, those are listed in statute. Um, they're kind of hanging over here while we focus all of our attention on the content and performance. And those common core skills really start to capture what we heard again and again of what is essential for graduating seniors to have. So not only do they know some stuff, but they are problem solvers, they have interpersonal communication, computational banking, critical banking, creativity, life, personal and finance skills. Right now, our current system pays lip service, and that might be even a little bit generous, because our accountability system is all in on content and performance standards. So I think that's another part of what this conversation can include, is how can we have students have a chance to be uh, creative if creativity takes longer, right, to do a project. It takes a lot longer to do a project to cover a topic than it would if I just stand up there and lecture really quick. Well, that creative project might inspire, inspire it might create a passion, it might uh, allow that student to discover something that they wouldn't have got just by learning and passing a multiple choice test. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, follow up. Uh, so real quick, Mr. Furman, um, I guess what I would ask there, and I think this discussion has been had with multiple chairs since my time in the legislature and on this committee, um, what is the discussion surrounding the reduction or, and or the consolidation of standards and your accountability, the accountability model? Uh, because it seems to me that when we have the discussion about the basket of goods, really the basket of goods, um, yeah, you know, the original argument that I had is it was used to be a backpack. Now we've got this knapsack that we're dragging. It's got holes in it and it's ripping at the seams. I don't see it that way anymore, um, except for the fact that what we're dragging behind us is the contents performance standards. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that's what's ripping at the seams. We've got standards that, like you just said, we are paying lip service in some portions and we're breezing through on others and then we're spending two, three, four weeks at a time on other ones. Um, so what has the discussion been at the state board level to consolidate those and make sure that the understanding is that these are the ones that actually need to be taught and the ones that we're paying lip service to, maybe they shouldn't be included. I, I would like to know what, what the state board's uh, thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm glad to say, I think we're, we're tackling that head on and computer science sort of led the way for that. So right now, the way the system works is people who are passionate about English get together and tell everybody else what uh, they should cover in English. Well, guess what? there's a lot of stuff English teachers uh, care about English. And then we do that for math, we do it for science, we do it for history, we do it for physical education. And because each of those are created in a silo, we lose kind of the forest for the trees. And so what the state board is interested in, in, in having our standards teams do is do exactly that, is to tell not only what is, is good to know, but what is essential to demonstrate you've learned. And that shift is happening finally now. And I think the work of the Department of Education um, through the system of support and all of the work of PLC really has exposed teachers to that kind of thinking where it's not enough just to say you taught it. It's, it's you've got to demonstrate students have learned it. You've got to be able to answer, answer PLC question number two. How will you know if students learn? And then and then we have an opportunity to talk about three and four, which is what do you do if students don't learn and what do you do if students do? And that's where it would be nice to have a system that has some flexibility. So for our students who are learning and getting it uh, and show competency are able then to maybe go dive deeper into a passion that ultimately might come back and, and serve our state. Um, I don't know if I've answered your question, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And it does sound to me, um, like you just said, it's to me, it seems like there's 
you get a group of people that are really passionate about one thing and they throw all the things that need to be brought into there. Uh, I think there needs to be, at least in my opinion, at least a little bit of a removal from that to say what truly needs to be taught, what truly is our portrait of a graduate, um, not what every person who loves reading Thoreau believes is the best way to handle this. So uh, I appreciate that this is on your guys' radar. I, I truly do. And I look forward to further discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Preparinen had a question earlier. Do you still? I, I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've been talking about the portrait of a graduate, but being an elementary teacher, I'd also look, like to look at the portrait of a middle school student, the portrait of an elementary student. We've talked about um, maybe including service and application of those skills at a high school level. And I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion as to what it might look like and how we can have application of these skills at the different levels of education. You know, as an elementary school teacher, I'm overwhelmed by the number of standards we have. Our district has been working on what we call priority standards, where we've looked at all the standards that are out there and we've gleaned what we think are the most important because as Mr. Furman said, there are so many skills to do that we need, if they're all important, then there are none of them are important. Um, I think of my time when I was with the, volunteering with the Boy Scouts of America or the Cub Scouts. And the youth really liked the application of the skills that we were teaching them. They were marking off the requirements and many of those took on a physical application and involving application of those things rather than what Representative Landon was talking about, just these content standards where we can say something and they have to put it on a test so they show that they got it. But there's really no application of the skill. And I'm just wondering if if we can look to the, the paradigm of what the Boy Scouts of America or the Cub Scouts did and the possibility of redesigning some of our content standards so the kids are actually having an application of the things that we're teaching them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, and I, I'm gonna risk butchering your last name. So please correct me if I don't get this correct, but representative, peep, nope. <laughs> it's not peep, nope. It's not peep, nope. Peeperini? Peeperinen. Peeperinen. Thank you so much for your question. I think you're absolutely spot on. I, as you were talking, I was just thinking back to my own K-12 experience. And the reason I became a science teacher and passionate about science was that my sixth grade teacher, uh, for teaching about electricity, just threw out a bunch of batteries, light bulbs, and wires and gave us time to mess around with them, right? And I, I wired up my desk so a light came on when I opened it, and I thought that was pretty cool. And and I think a little bit of, of that has been lost for, for students in elementary because our accountability puts so much focus on reading and math, as it should, right? Like those are essential baseline foundational skills. But some of the things that have been lost is that ability to do, to demonstrate, that ability to, to really give students the opportunity to have an open-ended experience in, in the learning. And, and, and teachers are working dang hard to try to capture that while at the same time, make sure they cover all of those standards. So by, by being able to set priority standards, like you said, at, at more of a a system level, I think it allows individual teachers and districts to come up with ways that they have more freedom and flexibility to, to teach those other skills in ways that might take a little bit more time, but are more likely to instill a passion for our students. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Going back to Representative Freeman's question about financial literacy and just things we want, you know, high school students to be able to do as adults. And um, 
I was visiting with a friend of mine. She works in banking and she's really passionate about this. She's been involved in offering classes and being just has done some really important work. But I was kind of sad to hear that even in Cheyenne, we have these three triads, three high schools, that there's a really robust class in one triad, but not in the other. And so, you know, I'm just trying to get my arms around like even what's happening statewide. And so, you know, and there are other examples of kind of those quote unquote lip service things that we have. Um, how do you see this all kind of rolling out though so that we as legislators can tell our constituents, no, here's, this is actually happening. Like how ideally would this work for you so that we know it's not piecemeal and that, you know, it, is it just lip service for some schools, even within a district, um, but statewide, that we're really achieving what, what we're trying right. to do. And, and, and to answer that question, it's, it's really tricky, right? Because what is easy to, to measure to demonstrate that uh, and, and those things that are important get all of the focus for that very reason so that we can compare and say, you're doing good, you're, you're not doing good. Um, and so as we talk about these other skills the, and wrapping them into the, the performance and content standards, how do we do that in a way that we ensure that no matter where you go to school in our state, your teacher is going to be able to ensure that you're learning those really priority skills? And then how do we create those opportunities for at any level of the system for students to, to maybe be able to dive deeper into their passion? So it's this real dichotomy between threading this needle of uniformity, which we're required to do, but at the same time honoring both individual passions of students, uh, teachers, and districts. And that's why we want to begin with the profile of a graduate um, to kind of set a target and an ideal for what we want our business community members to think about when they think about hiring someone straight out of, of our high schools or our university system, what do they want when they enroll a freshman? Um, and we also wanna hear what local boards are doing so that when we set that goal and we have that target and we start working backwards then through all of the content standards to align to that and focus our standards, we're arriving at a place that everyone wants us to arrive at. Go ahead, Representative, or I'm sorry, Senator Ellis, you wanna follow up? Yeah, just to follow up, I mean, I, I'm worried that there's just like, how do you motivate schools that don't want to do it or teachers that don't want to do it? That's, I guess, the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, we can have the standards and have our goals written down, but, you know, were we missing something to really get people inspired to actually do what they're supposed to do or? Well, I, I, a barrier? I think, you know, we're drifting over outside of, uh, of the lane for the state board and into systems of support, but I do know that the work there in the PLC model is very powerful to answer that question. I mean, I taught 10 years before coming up here to Sheridan, which is, I think is well known, is very all in on the PLC model. And that model of collaboration between teachers, having a clear goal, collaboration, sharing what's, what's working, allowing for risk so that we capture innovation and then we share it is I think a, a possible, I don't want to say model, but, but it's, it's something that I think the, the Department of Education has been working to share with, with schools because it is successful. Um, I don't know if that completely will address all of those concerns, but I do know it has made me a better teacher. And at our school, it ensures that the best idea is being used by, by everyone. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Ryan, real quick, you, you said that something that I'm just wanting a little bit of clarification on sure. here. You said you'd like to have the standards be that no matter where you go within the state, the same student's going to be taught the same thing and they're going to understand it and that's going to be the case, correct? Well, kind of-ish, if, if I can, can be mushy about that. It's, it's that... I forget who spoke about local districts prioritizing the standards. That has to happen right now because the breadth is so so wide for our standards. And so each district is prioritizing those standards uniquely, which starts to erode the idea of that uniformity that the standards are supposed to be providing. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, just a quick follow up on that. Yeah. So 
it, the uniformity is, I guess, what I have the, the problem with. Isn't that the definition of a standard? Isn't that what we are saying we are trying to establish is a standard, which is the threshold of uniformity across the district? And so, uh, districts, sorry. And so my, my question is, I guess as a sitting here as a legislator, I'm concerned that we have districts prioritizing different standards. Right. That that's not that's not what I think our standards are saying. I think what we're asking for is for standards to be met. And if you guys, if the state board has created too many standards, that's something that you guys need to address, in my opinion. Um, and I guess maybe I'm concerned that we're hearing about this in this this form, is that we have far too many standards, you're ultimately the ones that develop those standards. So I'd like to maybe get a little bit of an understanding of why we're sitting here saying now we want to have a standard when that's exactly what we've asked and, and dictated in statute. Sure. Guys. Yeah, we have standards. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. I think part of this came in in the early aughts with kind of the, these national models of more robust standards that were adopted had a lot more in them and asked more from our, our teachers and ultimately our students. And, and by leaning on that model, we have robust set of standards now. And so the issue comes back to the covering versus learning. And so as we adopt the PLC model and we want to ensure students are not just sitting there and being exposed to these standards, but are taking something out of our class where do we provide the, the clarity for our teachers in our districts to know what we want to ensure? And I think that's the big difference is, is ensuring, not just because you sat in a chair and were able to get a D, um, but what are the specific components that we want you to have as you leave our system? And I, we don't have that clarity right now, and that is a direct result of the standards that have been adopted in the past. Um, but we are recognizing that that we do need to provide better clarity to our, our schools. Okay, so that kind of takes us up to thinking about alternative high schools and the accountability model that alternative high schools are under. What have we learned by looking at that accountability model with alternative high schools and the standards. I mean, they're they're a whole different bailiwick, if you will, versus a regular high school. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I, I don't have vast personal experience with alternative high schools. Um, so I don't feel really prepared to, to speak in depth on that. I do know um, we have one of the, the, the only alternative middle schools here at Sheridan Junior High School. Um, and, and they have a really important role to play. And I think in some ways they do provide uh, an experimental model for what might work for, for some of our students. They have more flexibility um, because of, of that model. They, they rely on relationships is, is baked into the accountability with their, their climate surveys. And so I do think um, they capture a little bit of what might work for every student. I think every student would benefit from uh, having a school that's focused on making sure they feel safe and belonging, um, as well as having some flexibility to, to work with the student's individual needs. But, but if I'm honest, I, I don't think I can speak much further than that on the topic. Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else have any questions on the state board? Diana, would you like to add anything at one point? You look like you were ready to say something. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, <clears throat> I would just share, um, listening to this conversation today, um, I would say I am excited to be working with the State Board and this endeavor that they've taken on. And certainly, you can hear the leadership and the vision in um, Chairman Furman and, and excited about that. I think this process will lead to efficiency. And, and that, I feel, is a call coming from many voices across the state. Uh, especially in the standards review process and setting those standards. And I think it's important to understand that in that history, we started with some standards, right? And um, developed state standards in more areas. Then people wanted more clarity, particularly when we move into assessment systems. 
clarity on those standards and then benchmarks start being developed and then this national trend of robust standards as Chairman Furman mentioned. And so I think it was an evolution and a growth and a lot of things have come together right now to cause us to look at this and say, okay, how do we as a state um, bring some efficiency to all of these processes. And it's exciting to me to think about this happening in a way that brings multiple voices together. Our business and industry, they, they have needs and they have ideas and innovation to share with us. Local school districts ha have done work. And when we bring it together, I think it's going to be an exciting conversation to see really how far we are in this conversation and pull all of those, those gems together and, and bring a product forward for the state that, that really um, raises the level and quality of education in Wyoming. Thank you, Diana. Representative Freeman, you have a question? Just a comment. When um, Diana was talking about all the different people that are, are adding um, voices to the, the conversation, I think one of the, the very important groups that needs to be part of that is students or students that have graduated um, you know, within, well, I'll say four years for lack of a better way. I learned more when my students came back uh, you know, the next year or two years after they graduated and, and told me, this is what you did really well, Mr. Freeman. This is what you suck at, Mr. Freeman. This is what you got to work more on. And, um, and I, I think you have to add the student voice to where that you can, uh, you can get a full rounded opinion of what, uh, of what uh, things are. Thank you, Reverend. Can, can I respond to that? Certainly. I, I think that's really wise. And as Superintendent Balo spoke to, there were students who the paradigm that was our spring really worked for the first time, they were performing better uh, in that paradigm than, than the old standard paradigm. And personally here at our junior high, there was a handful of students who really excelled um, in, in those unique opportunities. And so I think hearing from those students about what is working and what isn't working is a, a powerful suggestion that we will incorporate. Very good. All right, well, we're about a half hour ahead. Um, let's take a break. Let's take a 15 minute break and we'll come back at, at uh, 10 15 and we'll start back in with K 12 education program. Be back with Ryan and Diana and hear what they have to say about the K 12. Hey, Mr. Thank Chairman, uh, what about public comment on this section? Well, that'd be great. Mr. Chairman, I think you can take your computer science uh, discussion and then at the end, you have uh, one person, Kenda Carrier from the School Board Association, uh, that sign up for public comment. Okay. So with that suggestion, we'll just go into computer science and that way we can free up Ryan and Diana. So go ahead. Super, okay. So, um, we want to first just begin by recognizing the hard work of the department and specifically Lori Hernandez, Director of Standards and Assessment, who has been just doing a Herculean effort to work computer science and, and then all of the standards further down the road. Um, so I'm just going to kind of summarize the work that's happened since we last spoke. A lot of this is happening off to the side and then we'll be brought back to the state board. But um, just so you know that the work is progressing, there were 12 educators who were from the original standards review committee who met virtually in the beginning of June, who worked to identify those computer science performance standards. Prior to the meeting, there was like a, a unique uh, activity. First, subcommittee members were asked to individually identify the standards they viewed as critical. And then secondly, uh, that list of standards was sent out to be distributed amongst all educators. And then that information was brought back to that committee, identifying what teachers across the state thought were priority for the computer science uh, standards, those performance standards, which would 
would drive that focus of ensuring learning in the district accountability system. So that input was then received and, and ultimately the proficiency standards or excuse me, performance standards were crafted with the accompanying performance level descriptors that will provide teachers that clarity of knowing that a student knows that standard. So how do you know if they've learned it? Uh, those are the jobs of the PLDs. That work of that subcommittee was presented at our June 19th board meeting and we approved those um, and have sent those out for, for public comment again, uh, public wide. And that's been happening through July and August. And we are expecting in September for that all to come back so we can see what the public writ large has commented on those standards and fully anticipate that, uh, that unless there's a glaring thing or issue that those will then be moved on by the board for final promulgation and uh, should be ready, you know, depending on the, the governor's review time at late December, early January, hopefully they would be uh, included with the content standards in chapter 31. So I think the only other thing I'd like to note is even with the performance standards coming in a little bit behind the content standards, um, the Department of Education reported that, that half of those 158 respondents on that survey were uh, marked that they currently were already uh, teaching or beginning to teach those computer science for this school year. So um, that wall is crossing over the in, in line, in zone, into the end zone. Since this is our only form of football that we have as a state, I think we can celebrate here <laughs> at the end of uh, so I, I ended on a sad note, and I apologize for that. And, and with that, I, I stand for questions. Any questions on computer science standards? Anybody? OK. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank um, Board Chairman Furman. I think you know, been really transparent, really honest with us as a committee on where you are in developing those. and. Um, just really appreciate all the work that you've been putting into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jamie Flintner, I'm sorry, Representative Flintner. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just have a quick question of Mr. Furman on um, your responses, the 158, is that a no, high number, no, low number? Just curious on that with regard to your educators who responded. Sure. I, I think the hard part to know is, uh, is this was in, in late spring. And so our educators were dealing with a lot. So I don't know how this would compare to what we can call it a typical spring when, when, when teachers are in schools and administrators are able to share out that there's a survey for them. Um, as well as how many teachers currently feel strong enough about computer science to weigh in, I think is also kind of a unique factor or variable. So I'd actually, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think we, we did get, it was nice to have all of those voices weighing in on focusing what they thought was important to guide the work of that committee. And I think it serves as a model going forward when we talked about in our last conversation, um, how do we take all of these standards and, and signal to teachers that these are essential learnings to demonstrate competency to see on. Okay, thank you. Further questions before we go to public comment? Go ahead, Chairman Coe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would only say one thing, Senator Ellis has been our watchdog on this deal and, and you know done a great job. And, and if she's happy, I'm happy. I'm happy to. Is that, is that a question, Representative Brown? Uh, just a quick statement, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to thank uh, Ryan as well. And uh, I'll publicly state, I, I sent him an email, um, but I'll, I'll publicly state it as well. Um, my comments a few minutes ago were a little brash and a little, uh, a little fiery. So I wanted to publicly announce my apology to Mr. Furman. Um, I, I, you know, sometimes we get a, a little carried away, but there's things that are near and dear to our hearts. And 
Um, so I, uh, my public apologies to you, Mr. Furman. Um, this is not something that you have created or you have done. Uh, you've just simply inherited a mess and I appreciate you willing to tackle it head on. So thank you. Mr. Chair, can I respond to that? Certainly. I, I, I thank you for that apology. I don't, I'm not sure it's needed. I will say as a junior high principal, I find this conversation really enlightening. I get to go patrol a lunchroom full of socially distant kids and tell them to pick up their carrots. So um, thank you. I, I, I thought this was a great conversation about something that is really important. Very good. All right, for the questions before we go to public comment. None appearing, we'll move to public. Oh, Chairman Coe, do you have a question? No, I just want to compliment Superintendent Balo for uh, her input and coordination of the reopening of schools. And, and I, I thought it was very well done. Um, you know, it's going quite well up here. I guess it's only been three days. And uh, it's nice to see you over the 4th of July up here with your family. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I just want to compliment you for your efforts to reopen the schools in Wyoming. Agreed. Agreed. All right, so we'll move to public comment. Um, who's Mr. up? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Superintendent. Thank you. I, I would be remiss if I didn't take 10 seconds and just absolutely give the kudos to the working group, the task force, the governor, the state health officer, and most importantly, the school districts that came up with stellar local plans to reopen schools. So thank you for the gratitude, but oh my gosh, yeoman's work at the local level and across the board. That's right. Yep, true story. Good job, districts. Okay, who's up first for public comment? Mr. Chair, we have not seen uh, Mr. DeCaria come into the room yet. And uh, Mr. Mullen from the Wyoming Education Association wasn't there, but he just left. So um, perhaps maybe we take a break and then see if they come in over the break period. All right, we'll do that. We'll take a, a 10 minute break and we'll come back and take more public comment if it appears. So we'll be back at Verizon time 10.06, so 10.16. Thank you.
back at it. Oh. That's what I want to come back to this I love the way the light comes in. Yeah, yeah, I really don't. That's great. So, huh. it did, didn't it? So, anyway, so, um, Hi, Ken. Hello, Mr. Chairman. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Good to have you on board. Thanks. Hello. Hi, Ken. Hi, John. How are you doing? You know, I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Good. Hey. Thank you. 
Yeah. And we'll get started here when we get some more people back online. Okay. Seems it doesn't matter if it's video or uh, or in person. Breaks are a little bit longer than what uh, what we uh, we announce. Yeah, that's pretty common. <laughs> We've got almost everybody from the house back, one senator, two senators. They're coming. There's three. All right. Now we got a quorum now. Um, so we'll go ahead with the public comment period or portion of this meeting. And with us is Ken DeCaria. Ken, would you like to go ahead and give us your comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me fine. Yes, sir. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I'm Ken DeCaria. I'm with the Wyoming Association of School Boards, uh, the Wyoming School Boards Association. And what we'd like to convey is the School Boards Association is excited about the work being done on the profile of a graduate. We believe that work uh, by being done by the state board is doing, is, is progressive and it, it, it's a good approach to what needs to be done. The process, I think, is also good because it's going to be stakeholder driven. They are, the state board, I think, is also very much aware that they need to avoid adding more requirements to districts and, more importantly, requirements to students. I think it's positive because it also addresses the common core of knowledge, but it also the common core of skills. And I think sometimes, you know, we do one at the expense of the other one. I think this can move beyond, you know, just having that test to that demonstration of the ability to, to demonstrate uh, how they can use those knowledge and skills together. And uh, the School Boards Association uh, is committed to helping the process move forward and, and we're excited for the work. Mr. Chairman, just one additional thing too is, I think from some of the conversation today from the committee, I think we need to be careful about separating the profile of graduate. That's very different from how you get to that point. And you know, the journey to this profile, that's where you know, where the nuts and bolts are involved. And I think that's going to be an important piece of, of this process. Uh, you know, and, and some of those other parts to this, and as, as far as being online or in person, you know, some of those skills like interpersonal skills, you know, you're going to have to have people interacting with each other uh, in order to get to that point. But with them as a chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions and school boards association is very excited about this process. Thank you, Ken. Has anybody got a question for Ken? Senator Ellis, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I just kind of get another anecdotal thing I was noticing. Um, you know, as an attorney, I don't do a lot of creative writing anymore. And my husband and I were lamenting that kind of law school beats that out of you. And we were talking about stories we used to write when we were kids. And then looking at my three children, I just noticed that they don't write stories kind of ever. And so when we talk about like extra rigor being added to math and some of these other standards, I'm just asking your um, association kind of dig deep and ask people, you know, get to not just the perspective of those recent graduates that Representative Freeman mentioned, but kind of the longer look back. I mean, that's, that's something I miss. I don't know if I'm the only parent that feels that way, but to the extent that you can make those observations and recommendations, I think that I would certainly be interested in, in what you're hearing and, and what you, your board might be advocating for in the future, specifically on some of those kind of trade-offs of how we spend our time in classrooms. Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, yes, we we will do that. Further questions or comments? Thank you, Ken. We sure appreciate your comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and with that, we'll move on to work-based learning programs. This item was one that uh, Mike Greer was going to be commenting on. And uh, since Senator Rothfuss is on that same 
committee, and so is our good chairman, Co. You guys can bring us up to speed on what's going on. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, I'll ask uh, Senator Coe to fill in for anything that I miss. That I'll give a little bit of an overview of what we've looked at on the Minerals Committee with regard to some education attainment issues uh, and the idea of bringing uh, workforce development, uh, educational services, particularly in, in high school, I, I think is what um, Chairman Greer is focusing on and, and trying to build relationships with university community colleges, workforce services, Department of Education, and then our, our schools to make sure that there are opportunities for apprenticeships and, and what are effectively on the job educational opportunities and exploring that. Um, to be clear, a lot of those things already exist in Wyoming. And so a lot of the presentations we took were uh, kind of a review of what's out there. This committee has heard a number of those presentations. And uh, back in June, uh, we received a presentation and a briefing from Shelley Hamill at the department regarding workplace or excuse me, work-based learning programs that are administered through the department. So we, we know that we have activities going on, but the minerals committee is contemplating it from the economic development standpoint, really, and, and trying to find ways that we can empower business and industry in the state of Wyoming, uh, teaming up with education. So as, as kind of an overview of what we talked about, again, a lot of it was similar to what we've heard on the education committee, but for the minerals committee, a lot of it was new. Uh, we had presentations from the university of Wyoming, uh, president Theobald, or excuse me, president Seidel and, and vice president Theobald, uh, uh, both joined us to discuss ways to engage the university, uh, Sandy Caldwell and, and president Hickswa from the community colleges, uh, Dr. Caldwell on behalf of the, uh, community college foundation, but, uh, president Hickswa on behalf of Northwest College talked about some of the programs that they have been working with, which provide those opportunities, but some of the challenges that they face where I, I think one of the key challenges that came up uh, was really coming up with uh, concepts of risk and the possibility of um, legal considerations where if you have on the job work that is being administered through one of the community colleges and some type of apprentice program where you're being taught by a, a an instructor on the job that isn't effectively an accredited instructor instructor how do you handle any possibility of liability or or risk of of injury that there might not be uh, sufficient clarity and statute to really administer programs as robust as they could be. So that was one topic we explored a bit. Uh, we heard from the Department of Workforce Services programs that they've put together and the resources they have available through federal grants uh, to try and get to apprenticeships and, and work with industry. And then we had some examples from industry, which I, I thought were very good, where using programs that currently exist, uh, one entity that presented to us, for example, was able to bring on three interns when they really only had uh, originally a desire to have one intern, but the, the applicants were so good because of, of COVID right now, nobody could do their internships, uh, that they got three highly qualified interns partially paid for through grants. Uh, they paid a portion of the salary so they could at a low cost end up with these exceptional uh, workforce. And they're expecting at some point to, to bring all three of those individuals on as employees. So that, that was a, an excellent success story in terms of bringing on training on the job, but then having the opportunity to build industry as a result of it. So the committee is really looking for ways to empower industry throughout the state to do those types of things and, and also get those students educational credit and ensure there's opportunities for educational credit through that, as we do with, with some of our work-based learning through the department and some of the programs we have through workforce services. And then we heard from the governor's office, which uh, uh, Lachelle and the governor's office, uh, the discussion there was largely, our, how do we facilitate communication and bring everyone together in a way where we're knowing what all the resources are, what all the needs are, and, and harmonizing the efforts that are already underway, and then trying to identify if there are any barriers in place, if there's anything we need to do statutorily, or 
any actions that we need to take either through the education committee or through the minerals committee uh, to, to make this system work better and, and provide more of our students and even um, non-traditional students with educational opportunities that they might need to, to get this on the job experience. Uh, that led to a, a little bit of a discussion about trying to identify supply and demand, so to speak, in, in terms of the job market, uh, what jobs are going to be needed in the future, how do, I identify, how do we identify what industry is looking for in terms of trained individuals that might then be able to engage in an apprenticeship program so that we're supplying workers to industry as they're needed instead of just kind of speculating and hoping that they either end up being available or, or that there are jobs available when those individuals uh, complete a program. So providing opportunities to de-risk these apprenticeships for both the students and for industry uh, and, and make sure there's an alignment of, of needs and availability. And then we also heard from uh, Federal Department of Labor and their state apprenticeship office, uh, Michael Broad, presented to us, and, and I believe she presented to this committee before as well, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I know I recall other presentations, and I assume it was through, through our work on the education committee. Again, looking at the federal apprenticeship program, which is available and potentially underutilized, so that gets back to the, the conversation about communication and ensuring that we're actually using all the resources that are available and that, that everyone knows uh, whom they should be talking to. Um, Building more partnerships was another theme, just making sure that our community colleges, the university, our schools, were all working together instead of siloed. So trying to figure out a way that we can get that communication to take place and, and really maybe putting together some type of a working group or some type of a contact group among stakeholders specifically in this area uh, to break down those barriers and, and ensure that we are using all of the resources we can. So. We didn't take any action on a legislation or even propose any legislation. Uh, Chairman Greer sees this kind of as a, a few years of effort, uh, trying to identify ways that we can bridge that gap better and get industry and education involved with one another and, and provide more opportunities for students. Uh, anticipates more work moving forward now that we're a little bit better educated as the Minerals Committee, trying to explore what can be done and working with the Education Committee on trying to achieve those objectives. Uh, so really just a primarily a listening session at that point. A lot of it, this committee has heard before, but a lot of it was new for the minerals committee. And I, I think that pretty much sums up uh, what we looked at for a few hours last week. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd hand it over to chairman co to see if I'm, if I'm forgetting anything from the presentations. Chairman co. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think Senator Roth has forgotten much. I mean, he, he was very, very thorough. Uh, we had a good discussion on this particular item uh, to take our resources as we move into a different time in the economy of the state of Wyoming and to do all we can to enhance the, you know, the industry side with, you know, workforce development through our educational institutions. And I think, I think Senator Roth has hit it all. We had a good discussion. Um, and I think we'll continue this discussion because it's so paramount, so important as the state of Wyoming goes into a different time with the pandemic and the shift in minerals and economic development, industrial development. So thank you, Senator Office, for a very thorough summary. I think you probably did a better job than Representative Greer would have. <laughs> probably quicker. <laughs> Questions for Senator Office or Chairman Co. Go ahead, Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this I'm just kind of catching you both cold, but I listened to the discussion and something that's been percolating in my thoughts the last couple of years is when we start looking at workforce issues, we don't really have a dedicated committee where, and we've heard this before in recent years, that where the community colleges and where the university come to testify. So I am a little curious, you know, as we're looking for efficiencies within the legislature and how many committees we have, their workloads and their assignments. Maybe I would love to have the discussion and kind of open it up for other members of the education committee. What if we took the minerals economic development business committee and just really took off the minerals piece of it, maybe combine that with select federal natural resources and just looked at business and economic development or workforce and labor 
taking labor out of labor health and just having one dedicated committee focused on that. Um, and that way the university would have a landing pad, the community colleges would have a landing pad and our role on this education committee would be more K through 12 focused with obviously you know, onboarding our college students into the university uh, system and the community college systems. But I just wondered, um, you know, that's something structurally, I think as a legislature, if we need to really, because we hear that term all the time about diversifying our economy and how are we gonna grow jobs? And it is kind of funny, we don't have a dedicated group looking at just that issue. So just wondered if um, that would be, what your initial thoughts of something like that might be, that is something we could start talking about. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Chairman, uh, Senator, I'll say, you know, it, it has been interesting serving on the on the Minerals Committee. We call it the Minerals Committee, but but technically it is um, business and economic development activities as well. And and uh, from year to year, it it changes pretty dramatically whether we've got focus on that economic diversification, economic development, or whether we're heavily on on minerals, industry, coal, oil and gas. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's some significant merit to the idea of, of trying to find a way that we can better focus someone's attention, some entity's attention, uh, whether it's a standing committee, a select committee, something along those lines, getting someone to really focus on the ball on this one as we're looking at economic development uh, and doing it full time. Because it, on the minerals committee, well, certainly last session, or, and, and I think Chairman Koch can back me up on this, last session we talked about probably 90% coal, oil, and gas issues, I would say. Uh, and, and they were important. There were no question. I think we did some excellent work on Minerals Committee last session and, and brought some exceptional legislation that, that really uh, enabled some good things to happen. But it was, it was based on the limited bandwidth then uh, effectively taking away from what you would call economic diversification type economic development. It was, it was really working with existing industries. So um, I don't know if it's a new uh, change in the standing committees. Uh, you know, those, those are kind of dinosaur type issues where it's hard to make changes with that. But in, in terms of trying to get a focused group, uh, I think there's a lot of sense to the idea of, of this is a great time to get uh, some uh, a, a good group, and, and maybe it's some education committee members, maybe it's some minerals committee members, maybe it's a task force uh, style where we bring in some members from the public, from the executive branch, from industry to to tackle some of these issues. So I, I think that's certainly worthy of, of additional discussion and, and attention. Thank you, Senator. And as far as the community colleges go, I've kind of said that they're their landing places here with education and so that they can come to us to to have a place to go because they really don't have a place chairman co go ahead thank you mr chairman have you know being a dinosaur a dinosaur on the way out i might add um i think it has a lot of merit to it senator ellis i uh you know the focus in in the overall perspective of wyoming today is just so much different with the downturn in minerals and COVID 19 and the struggles that community colleges and the university are having with budgets and everything like that. Uh, I think it'd be a good subject to take to management council. I think that'd be a good spot for it. And I see, I think Senator Landon's on management council. I see him welcome bill, but I, I think it has a lot of merit to it because these are definitely, definitely different times as we move forward. I mean, this, you know, we're looking at a new normal out there. And maybe, maybe for a long, long time. And, and you know, one point five billion dollar shortfall in funding state government, things like that. So, good discussion. I commend you for bringing the concept to us. And maybe it should go to management council. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Landon. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, sorry, I was a little bit late joining you all. It's it's good to see you. Um, I share a lot of the thoughts of my Senate colleagues uh, on that and had actually visited with Senator Ellis uh, in, in the months gone by a little bit on this topic. And, and I'm, uh, I'm supportive. I really think, I think that the Senator has hit on something. I think it's very much worthy of a, you know, of a robust discussion in management council. 
um, regarding how we divide up the workload and, and where we put our emphasis. Um, and, you know, that maybe begins, I'm not sure, I would lean on Chairman Coe and maybe you, Chairman Northrop, as to how that suggestion comes, but it, I think it could come from an individual senator and, and be taken up uh, right away by management council as we enter a new biennium. But, um, Mr. Chairman, I just, I just wanted to throw out a couple of thoughts. I, I really appreciate Senator Rothfuss, Senator Coe, um, talking about this work-based uh, work learning program uh, effort that is underway. And uh, having worked at the college all those years, I've thought about this a lot. Uh, we actually lost some students through the years uh, because there really was not an opportunity for them to um, adequately work in a work-based learning environment. Uh, and so they had to, they literally had to leave because of the structure that we tend to put them in in higher education. A lot of structure in K through 12 as well, but the structure, uh, even at the community college level, certainly at the university, you know, your, your class load is going to be, you know, 10 to 11 in the education building, and then you're in the science building from one to two, and then you've got a three o'clock lab, and then pretty soon you really don't have the ability to uh, to participate in a work-based program. So um, I, I can understand why Chairman Greer is saying that this may take more than just one year. And I got to be honest with you, Mr. Chairman, I think part of the reason for that is this whole education environment. Uh, we've all been on this committee long enough to know that sometimes change in education is hard to come by. Uh, so I think that's one of our biggest challenges is how do we, you know, how do we welcome this, this new way of, of educating our students out there? And it, it's going to take some flexibility for sure. Thanks for allowing me a comment or two. Thank you, Senator. Um, Representative Connolly had a hand up earlier. Do you still have a comment? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And and just to kind of echo the, the last couple of speakers, Chairman Coe, I agree with you. This is the kind of question that could and should go to Management Council. Senator Ellis, um, I like your idea. I probably wouldn't make the committees like you suggested, but that would be the great conversation. Um, I don't think that education is all about economic development and business, but when you said that, it occurred to me that economic development and the corporations, that's a combination that maybe should be there with all of the emphasis and need for us to be thinking about health, right? Should we take labor out of that? Because honestly, like minerals spends 90% of its time on minerals and not and only 10 on economic development. I think the labor health committee spends 10% of its time on labor and 90% on health. Or we really need to be looking at issues of labor with economic development far more than we are right now. And so I would welcome that question going to management council. I've heard of others too wanting to kind of think about the number of standing committees that we have. Should we have 10? Maybe we should have eight, maybe we should have 12. Um, those are good questions. So thank you for bringing it up. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Yeah, just to comment briefly. And, you know, my goal isn't to do more select committees. I think our LSO staff is overworked. We, you know, keep continually ask more of them without necessarily providing them with more resources. So it really is, you know, I'm trying to kill two birds with one stone is how do we make ourselves more efficient with our committee structures and not just add to it, but be leaner and more focused. And I think I'm not saying that, you know, K through 12 is should, I just think that that's kind of what we spend the bulk of our time on is K through 12. And then sometimes we get to colleges and university. So it's more like 80, 20. So I'm just trying to think of efficiencies, but, um, Anyway, I just want to make that comment. I don't support adding more select committees or task forces or anything of that sort. Okay, Representative Freeman. I, I think we should look at the committee system, uh, but I'm pretty strong on the idea that we we should have uh, the higher education and K-12 uh, go to one committee. I think we have problems because Right now, I think that the university and um, the community colleges committee is the appropriations committee. And instead of talking about uh, how to make education in Wyoming better, especially between 
uh, secondary and post-secondary education, we're, we're, we're spending more time working about money. I uh, served on Complete College uh, America for, for eight years. And one of the things that uh, we continually talked about and tried to, to look at is, is that 50% of high school graduates go to college needing remedial uh, something, whether it's English or math. And there's really not the connection between post-secondary and secondary. I worked in both, uh, both areas and it's like we've created this silo and, and somewhere, somehow we have to force um, the three, the, the community colleges, the university and K-12 to talk to where that uh, we find uh, better ways to educate our, our students and efficiencies. So let's look at the, the systems or the, the committees. I think that that's a good idea. The one thing I think we really should do is put all the education um, uh, institutions into one committee and, and basically force them to work more together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Anybody else have any comments? Not appearing, we'll move on to the public comment period of this. Oh, Senator Ellis, you have a question, comment? Yep. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to take a crack at drafting a letter for all of us to consider. And if we wanted to vote on it as a committee, just encouraging management council to maybe realign or consider realignment of some committee assignments, because it is, I mean, I'm, I'm looking for an efficiency within our committee system structure. And I do think that we need more focus on, you know, why these colleges and why the university exists. I mean, there, our kids and our graduates are a huge export and we've got to figure out a way since we've invested all that money into those kids and their education, how do we keep them enticed and being in Wyoming? And I, I just think we've got to be, do a better job of that as a legislature. So I'm happy to take a craft, a draft at a, or draft a letter for the committee to review if you think that's appropriate. Yes, why don't you do that and send it out to us and we'll take a look. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Okay, any other comments? We'll move on to public comment. And I see that Dr. Boyd Brown is in the waiting room, waiting to, well, he may be. There he is. Go ahead, Dr. Brown. Uh, you're really breaking up badly. Um, we can't understand a word you're saying. Sorry, right, doctor. Okay, so we'll see if Boyd gets a better chance to get a connection. Maybe we can make his comments on another period of time when we're doing public comment. Is there any other public comment out there? Did I miss anybody? Not appearing. Let's go on to effective tax rates, comparisons of Wyoming and surrounding states. Um, Don Richards, you want to present this for us, please? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Northrup, members of the committee. My name is Don Richards. I'm the Budget and Fiscal Administrator for the Legislative Service Office. It's a uh, particular privilege to appear before your committee today. Uh, chairman Coe served as the chairman of the first committee that I staffed back in the 53rd Legislature Management Audit Committee. So it's an honor to appear uh, before you again. I'll be speaking today from a one-page handout. If Karen could uh, post that on your screen, if that's acceptable with the committee. Uh, handout number 7-01 in your committee packet, and it is in response to a uh, committee inquiry at the uh, Joint Education Committee's last meeting in early June. I believe Representative Obermiller initiated the discussion on this topic. Uh, the task that was given to LSO at your June meeting was to estimate the tax capacity. This is the term of the requester. Uh, LSO further defined that term uh, with some limited uh, communication with the requester. And so for purposes of this request, uh, LSO has defined tax capacity to be an estimate of the Wyoming public revenue increases 
from imposing a tax at the median rate of surrounding states and North Dakota. Of course, this term could be defined in a variety of ways. So put differently, if Wyoming were to impose taxes at the median level of those states, what additional revenue for the state, for school districts, and for other political subdivisions would be generated? That was the question we were posed. Uh, the primary sources for this data uh, was a tax foundation, which is a tax policy nonprofit, representatives of which have regularly appeared before the Joint Revenue Committee, as well as the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence. Now, some of these entities certainly have some policy preferences, but we're not relying on their uh, policy advocacy. Rather, we are only using their source data gathered and published by these entities, not their analysis or policy preferences. Finally, I should mention that uh, Dean Tempty on LSO staff was primarily responsible for much of the analytical work of this one page document. However, he is occupied with other assignments today, so I will be presenting it. Moving to the table, the columns represent four major revenue uh, raising taxes. The first two columns reflect income taxes. The next is sales taxes. The next three columns uh, represent property or ad valorem taxes. And then finally, the last column uh, represents fuel taxes. Now moving down through the rows, the first set of rows largely co colored in white or no color uh, represent uh, the tax rates in each of the surrounding states with uh, North Dakota added. The median of each row is also highlighted in yellow as well as uh, reproduced at the bottom of the list of states. The next two rows uh, illustrated in blue are Wyoming's tax rate uh, followed by the increase, and it is an increase in all cases, in Wyoming's rate that would be needed to elevate it up to the median. And then finally in green is LSO's estimate for the amount of revenue that would be generated in the event Wyoming elected to impose the median rate across those uh, seven states. You will also note that about 40% of the page is populated with sources, methodology, and assumptions. In other words, notes. Uh, there are significant dis, uh, differences in comparing tax structures across states. For example, Idaho, Montana, Nebraska, and North Dakota have a progressive scale of individual income taxes. As we note in our uh, remarks at the bottom, uh, LSO has used the highest uh, rate in, these, uh, in this analysis. Why is that? Well, first of all, we had to uh, identify a tax structure that would be uh, consistent with Wyoming's constitutional provisions, 1518, that's Article 15, Section 18, related to income tax credits, which is unique to Wyoming. And that sets the income uh, level at a rather high uh, amount. In addition, uh, we had to apply some set of constraints in developing these estimates. For income taxes, we used uh, 2020 House Bill 147. That legislation certainly failed. Um, nonetheless, it provided a contemporaneous and established uh, defined income limitations and process. Similar to the issues raised by uh, individual income taxes, corporate income tax estimates uh, require uh, some consideration as well. Uh, Nebraska and North Dakota have, um, uh, they, they have multiple tax rates. And again, we elected to use the highest tax rates uh, consistent with uh, 2020 House Bill 147 as a construct. Moving to sales and use taxes, uh, the revisions to the rate are much more straightforward. Uh, nonetheless, it should be noted that only uh, the only variable in this analysis is the rate. We did not consider the breadth of goods and services that are uh, uh, taxed in other states. So in some states, particularly South Dakota, they have a, a more robust uh, level of taxation on services uh, than the other states, including Wyoming. Importantly, the rates include on sales taxes, both the state, statewide uh, tax, as well as the local optional tax, both in Wyoming, as well as the selected states. And it raises uh, several challenging questions as to what the median tax is if we were to look at the various goods and services. What is the median between food, funeral services, accounting services, and farm implements? Well, those are subjective um, evaluations. So we did not take into account 
which goods and services we only took into account the rate. Uh, regarding property or ad valorem taxes, the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy provides outstanding sources of effective tax rates, which allows us to assess um, the effective tax rates, which considers both the mill levy as well as the assessed value ratio. In fact, uh, their survey of materials uh, include both residential, commercial, industrial. They include urban as well as select rural facilities. And they also looked at different values of property as well as different percentages of personal property within those uh, commercial properties, for example. Uh, as a result, we used average of averages and in industrial properties, for example, we averaged 12 different values or up to 12 different values per state. Uh, to come to an aggregate value for, for example, the state of Colorado. Uh, fuel taxes are perhaps the most straightforward as the basis is the volume of fuel sold. And as it turns out, a gallon uh, measured in Wyoming is usually a gallon measured in uh, Colorado. So there's no um, uh, difficulties on the fuel taxes. Uh, moving to the bottom, you can see the first two uh, taxes, income, uh, individual income and corporate income. Wyoming does not have, uh, has not imposed either of those, so it would be a, a substantial increase. With respect to sales taxes, that's the second closest to the median and would uh, impose, uh, moving to the median would uh, increase Wyoming's tax by about one and a half uh, percent. Uh, Moving to the three columns on uh, property taxes, uh, residential properties are taxes that median is 40% higher than Wyoming's current tax rate. Commercial property is 78% higher and industrial property, the median of those seven states is 38% higher than the current rates uh, in Wyoming. And then fuel taxes are actually the closest um, it is uh, approximately six cents difference, which is the equivalent of a 26% increase uh, for Wyoming. Um, income taxes are obviously the most, uh, have the greatest differential as Wyoming currently does not implement any income tax. Uh, although some of these uh, revisions could be, or could be implemented more quickly than others, I would uh, move to the second row in the green and illustrate that if all of them were implemented, it would generate a total of $818 million. Finally, as with all LSO products, uh, we are and will respond to individual and committee requests. We are not advocating for or against the wisdom of any individual proposal. Happy to take uh, questions or provide further clarification on these. And you might want to uh, uh, take the, the, or yeah, take the share screen off for a bit. Go ahead, Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, I think uh, Dean did a really great job with this, by the way. I'm so impressed with the work that Dean Tempty does. He's just such a professional and he had to start from scratch basically because the request was uh, compare our tax capacity with our tax effort and that's what this really is and so without any further guidance he uh, the the two of you i think probably worked together in thinking through how to do this thing and i really appreciate the work that you did on it um, i was wondering if on i have a question specifically about the ad valorem part of it the property tax part of it how do these percentages have you converted those percentages to what that would mean in terms of the assessment percentages that we currently have, the nine and a half, 11 and a half assessment percentages? Have you made that conversion? Do you know what those percentages would be? Go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative uh, Obermiller. Um, yes, we have uh, looked at that and, and you're astute to point out that uh, the effective tax rate again on, on property is a combination of both the mill levy as well as the assessment ratio. Uh, presuming that the mill levies remain constant, um, the residential uh, ad valorem uh, assessed ratio would need to be increased from 9.5% to 13.3%. So that's about a 40% increase, fairly substantial. Uh, on commercial property, it would be even higher. It would be an increase from 9.5% assessed 
uh, ratio to 16.9%, which is uh, reflective of a 78% increase. And then finally, uh, residential, or excuse me, industrial would be the least increase that would move from 11.5 to 15.9% uh, for the assessed ratio, which re represents a 38% uh, increase. I'll add one more comment. And as uh, Representative Obermiller noted, um, Wyoming has two rates uh, or assessment ratios, not three. So if you elected to keep the residential and commercial uh, combined, uh, rather than increasing them to 13.3 and 16.9, the combined rate would be 14.1. So it's a little bit higher on the residential, a little bit lower on the commercial. If you elected to have a structure consistent with what is in statute currently. A follow up, Mr. Chairman. Certainly, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is this doesn't uh, this doesn't really represent the total capacity tax capacity or max tax capacity. This is a capacity based on the median rate, which I'm sure all of the members of the committee know. I'll state the obvious that there's just as many rates higher than that level as there are lower than that level. Is that a correct statement about uh, how, how you use the term median in this? Go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that, that is absolutely correct. Um, now, I, I acknowledge there is some subjectivity in that. Uh, we elected to use the surrounding states plus North Dakota, uh, given its uh, similarities in population. Um, uh, I suppose the analysis could be done with all 50 states rather than just our our neighboring states, um, and that that might yield slightly different results. But you're exactly correct. We're, we're not mirroring any other state. We're just uh, raising uh, Wyoming's to the median rate. Well, thank okay. you, Mr. Brown. Representative Brown, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just. Just a quick request, Don, you had labeled out all of the differences is, as far as a percentage difference of what the median um, to our rate was. Is there any way that you could have yourself or Dean update that to where it would include that as a uh, difference uh, percentage wise, not only for each one of those sections, but also as a total percentage difference, um, what our effective tax rates are compared to our surrounding areas? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Don. Uh, Representative Brown, uh, absolutely. And we can also include the, uh, uh, the response to Representative Obermiller's previous question on um, assessment ratios, if you would like that all on one, one sheet. The total is a bit, a bit more complicated, um, but we'll, we'll look at and see about what way uh, is best to represent that. The individuals is very, very straightforward and we can add that. Perfect, thank you. Good information, thank you. Further questions for Don? Go ahead, Representative Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don, thank you for this information. This is a lot of questions that my constituency is asking me, so I appreciate that. If you're tweaking the spreadsheet, would you do one more thing for me? Uh, in the first column, when we get down to in the blue, where it says Wyoming rate increase. If you would add the word potential in front of that, potential Wyoming rate increase, as so when people get copies of this, they don't automatically assume that we're already moving on this. That would, that would help me. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Office. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Don, thanks to you and, and thanks to Dean for putting this together. This, this really is a, a fascinating product. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first is, as we look over at the column on the right, so if we go to the median across the board on, on these seven plausible tax increases, um, and, and then we get a little ways down the road so that they're all in effect, it's, it's looking like 820 to $830 million of additional revenue per year. Uh, can you put that in context of what we're projecting is a, a shortfall under um, the scenarios that you've been presenting with regard to kind of the 
the worst case, the probable case, and the best case scenario for future revenue projections? Go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is the total revenue that would be generated. Not all of this would go to the state. So property taxes would um, assist uh, counties and, and municipalities, um, special districts, community colleges, and the like. Um, and we don't state how uh, the corporate or individual income tax would be um, distributed. Of course, fuel taxes would be by constitution um, distributed for the improvement of, of roads and highways. Um, with respect to in context, uh, first of all, it's important to note if the legislature uh, has any inclination to proceed with any of these, they take time. And you can see in particular uh, fiscal year 2023 and 2024, um, you know, we're in September of uh, 2020 currently before these could be fully implemented. So we're looking at the next biennium. Our best uh, estimates today of the next biennium's uh, shortfall is a billion dollars on the general fund side and a billion dollars on the school side for a total of $2 billion. Now, having said that, uh, the governor has already announced uh, budget reductions of 250 million per biennium. So that billion dollars on the, on the general fund side has been reduced to 750. Um, the impacts on the school size have not been changed. So if you add up the 818 and the 836, and this is not by design, it's just mm -hmm. happenstance, it turns out to be roughly the amount of the remaining after the general fund cuts of the remaining forecasted uh, budget gap. That's not to say things won't improve or get worse this fall with uh, economic impacts related to COVID, uh, but that's our current uh, baseline assumption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, Don, as, as a, a good bit of context. The next question I have is with regard to how the two income taxes were calculated in the first two columns. Um, I looked at the context of, of how it was developed, and this is from House Bill 147. So I wanted to see that House Bill 147 had a 0% income tax rate from zero through $200,000, first $200,000 of income, and then a 4% rate from 200000 and beyond, subject to tax credits pursuant to the Constitution for anything that um, any other taxes paid state local. Uh, so when we're looking at this 4.95%, I am, I am taking that as 4.95% instead of 4% in the bill above 200,000, or was this, because I think the number would be much, much higher if it were a 4.95% for everyone, uh, beginning at the, at the first dollar. So I was curious how that was calculated with regard to what's the cut in income for the beginning of the income tax for the individual income tax. And it was the same for the corporate income tax. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on how that was calculated. Go ahead, Don. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator, uh, yes, it's exactly as you describe. And hopefully uh, note three indicates that this is applicable tax rate only for the income over 200,000. Uh, the tax rate under 200,000 is 0%. Again, we had to create assumptions that may not be consistent with your uh, preference, but we had to use some construct to develop the estimates. No, thanks, Dan. And I thought it was a great bill. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that assumption. Um, the third question I have is with regard to the corporate income tax. Again, I, I believe this is on House Bill 147. And the $14.2 million is an interesting number. We, and when you look at corporate income tax in that bill, it really is very specific to the, the kind of in-state entities as opposed to uh, some proposals that Representative Obermuller worked on over the past few years that we've all looked at uh, that did some ex out of state capture. And, and it's my assumption that this 14.2 million then is based on the in-state capture instead of a model more similar to Representative Obermuller's out of state capture. Is that accurate? Don? Mr. Chairman, Senator, that is accurate. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate all of that. Senator Hutchings, you have a question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. This question is for uh, Don. Thank you very much. Don, um, I'm looking at the graph or the chart, and I'm just wondering, just for me, for a visual, could you include each state's population? Um, 
just for a visual for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, we will do so. Thank you, Don. Further questions for Don? Further questions? None appearing, we'll move on to public comment. Um, I did see Dr. Boyd Brown. And so if you would like to comment either on this section or the previous section because of the technical difficulties we were having, you're certainly welcome to, Dr. Brown. Uh, not any better. I understand that it is not the task of the Joint Education Committee to generate revenue bills. That being said, I felt that providing testimony following Mr. Richard's presentation was timely and an opportunity to share some thoughts with the committee. We're all aware of where education funding was prior to the current economic crisis caused by the oil price wars and COVID-19. These crises brought front and center some of the financial and economic issues that had been kicked down the road for some time. I wanna ask the members of the Joint Education Committee, those members who were tasked with being advocates for education and the shepherds for education policy that when the time comes and revenue bills are presented to please not close the door on any of these options and take into account and take into full consideration all of the options that may be presented. The Wyoming Education Association appreciates the difficult task that is before the legislature in addressing the financial crisis that Wyoming currently faces. The WEA supports using all appropriate alternatives to provide the reliable, consistent funding needy, needed, including alternative, uh, including the consideration of all potential forms of taxation to find the best combinations of revenue to properly fund public schools and the rest of Wyoming's economy. We understand and appreciate the severity and depth of the issue, but we also recognize that the state has some means to address this issue directly, which Don Richards presented today. The cuts that had been recently authorized by the governor, as well as the cuts to come, will have a substantial ripple effect on Wyoming's economy. The larger potential ripple effect is, of course, an exodus of Wyoming residents, taking with them the potential future entrepreneurs, business and community leaders, workers, and political leaders of Wyoming that we so desperately need in moving forward. The students of Wyoming schools today are these individuals, and they represent the hope and future of the state. How the legislature decides to address these economic issues will have a lasting impact on these students in the future of Wyoming. While the words economic diversification seem to be at the tip of everyone's tongue, it is of great importance that we recognize and acknowledge the findings of an economic diversification study conducted by Remy in 2016. The findings of this study essentially say that uh, economic diversification is not currently feasible in the state of Wyoming, given the state's current tax structure and economy. So for example, if a community were to add 100 new jobs in any given sector, those 100 new residents, their use of services and infrastructure would outpace the tax revenue created by these positions. What this means is that Wyoming's first step in addressing its economic crisis should be to address our greatly diminished revenue and our state's current tax structure. According to the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, ITEP, a nonpartisan research and policy institute, Wyoming has the 10th worst regressive tax structure in the United States. Our state's tax system disproportionately impacts low-income families and middle-class families, putting the burden of taxation squarely on the shoulders of those who are least able to pay. This must change. The economic dynamics of the world are changing. We can no longer pursue a business-as-usual approach to the economy of Wyoming. While Wyoming's energy sector has done well for the state in the past, they can no longer shoulder the burden of our state's economy on their own. Our state's future depends upon the success and amazing education that has been afforded to Wyoming students for years. These students represent a substantial investment and it's imperative that the state of Wyoming bear the fruit of that particular return on investment. Businesses and industry need well-educated workforce. Our economy is clearly based on the economic success of our working class citizens. And while the road ahead may be difficult, um, the WEA appreciates the difficulty of the task ahead, but we can't falter. Uh, for the sake of our schools, our educators, our students, and Wyoming's future. Uh, with that, I will stand for any questions. Any questions for Tate? Thank you, Tate, for your comments. Mr. Oh, Chairman. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, having been part of the revenue discussion last week, one of the comments or uh, several of the my colleagues made the comment that um, we don't know the target of what the actual revenue need is. 
without first looking at whether or not we've asked for some efficiencies in the K through 12 system. And so what would you, or how would you respond to those concerns in that kind of a line of reasoning? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ellis, uh, there are efficiencies to be found uh, within the K through 12 system. Um, I do want to note that, you know, the governor's uh, call for a voluntary 10% cut, like we need to be real clear that cuts, no matter where they're, they're implemented, uh, whether it was the health department corrections, K through 12, it is going to hurt. Um, it, is, it is going to have a negative impact. There are potential efficiencies to be found, whether that's through the purchasing of supplies, uh, whether that's through uh, some administrative district consolidations. Um, you know, we would love to be at that table for those discussions and to, to help evaluate some of those policy alternatives. Uh, but uh, that's, that's where we would stand. There are efficiencies to be found. Go ahead, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tate, um, you probably don't have the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and I'm hoping that we can get Dr. Brown on here. Um, how you just mentioned uh, what you're looking for and, and in response to Senator Ellis's question that we don't actually have a physical number that we're looking at at this point. Um, can you explain to me why I have received numerous emails throughout not only Laramie One, but multiple school districts explaining that school districts are already announcing that the legislature is cutting their budget and they need to start cutting X, Y, and Z out of their budget. And I've had no less than four emails uh, in the past two weeks from different school districts um, and different teachers in different school districts explaining to me that budget cuts are coming and they need to be aware of this. And I personally feel like this is a little bit of fear mongering from the education side of things. And I'm just kind of curious if you are aware of anything that I'm personally not aware of. Um, we have not touched the recal discussion yet. And I feel like if there's going to be any discussion on that, that's where it's going to be from. So maybe the WEA can give me a little bit of an understanding um, just with the breadth of your guys' resources, where this, where this hysteria may be coming from. Go ahead, Tate. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, uh, I am I'm not aware of uh, uh, why you're receiving these emails. Uh, you know, the Wyoming Education Association keeping a continuous eye on what is what is going on. Um, we are aware of the state's uh, financial situation. Um, we are having discussions and have had discussions with our members and districts in terms of um, there is a potential for it. It is, it, is not a, it is not a set in stone. And I think you're absolutely right that the recalibration is, uh, you know, we're very thankful that this, the timing of that was just, we couldn't be more, more lucky uh, because the recalibration, we need to have that discussion and we need to see where that is moving forward. Uh, so in terms of what we are having in terms of discussions with our members in some of these districts is, there is a potential. I mean, we are facing a serious revenue shortfall and for us to at least not put that on folks' radar that these are potential, there is a potential for this, uh, would be doing a disservice, but I can't answer as to why you're receiving those emails because that's that's just out of my purview. I understand that. And, and maybe we can speak offline, Tate. Um, I, I'd just like to, uh, to maybe get a little bit more understanding and um, just considering the, the state that we're in, um, and the situation that we're in, I feel as if this is uh, an inappropriate way to be handling um, our fiscal situation is by having teachers be scared that they're, they're going to be cut or anything along those lines uh, when there's been absolutely no motion in that direction. So um, maybe you and I can speak offline. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss, you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, and, and some thoughts as well, uh, you know, pushing back a little bit. The, the idea that we need absolute certainty on how much education is going to cost or be, or, or be short, when it's on the order of a billion dollars over the next couple of years, the, the idea that we need an exact number, it needs to be 1.037 billion before we'll take action. You know, I, I think that's just trying to push the issue off into the future. Uh, I understand why teachers are coming and, and, and if we're hearing from them saying that they're worried about the fact that they're not going to be funded, that's what I would tell them at this point in time. Maybe they heard it from me. Maybe I had a conversation with those teachers that were reaching out when they said, how does the budget look? And I say, well, we've got no new revenue on the horizon. The legislature's taking no action. 
Uh, we have a billion dollars of shortfall ahead of us. And the only way that will be solved unless we take some serious action is first of all, by spending all of the LISRA and then by drastically and draconianly cutting education. So if somebody's getting that message, maybe it's, it's from me. Uh, and we see in front of us solutions and, and we have Supreme Court decisions that suggest the legislature is compelled to take solutions through additional taxation, but we always just kind of want more information and we want to know how tight we can have the belt. Uh, I've been having that same conversation with all of you and we've been together in this for years and just talking about more studies, more looking at it, more checking it out. What else can we find out? And unfortunately, over the years, I, I haven't heard anything better. We've just gotten closer to the cliff. So at some point, someone in the legislature, and this can be the committee, needs to take action and needs to implement some of these changes. And uh, we've got a lot of options available to us, but we have to have the political courage and will to actually execute on those options. The idea that we're just going to keep asking questions, not going to solve any of the problems, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so that, that's just me on a little bit of a soapbox, and there's no question, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rothfuss. We'll go to Chairman Coe and then to Representative Obermuller. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, thank you, Senator Rothfuss. And recal meets next week, and I can assure you that all of this will be discussed. And, and I can assure you as well, I think, that there'll be discussions about some reductions in K-12. Uh, community colleges have already been hit hard with reductions at University of Wyoming. Whether or not we go in and we we look at ghost teachers, ghost health insurance that follows those teachers, classroom size, whatever it might be. But I can assure the committee that the discussions on K-12 will come up as it relates to reductions next week in recal. So, uh, you know, basically, if you look at what's gone on so far, K-12 has not taken any any reductions, you know, like other state agencies have. And so I just bring that up so that you know the recal, which I think meets on the 8th and 9th, you know, Senator Office, you're on there. Uh, and I can assure you this is going to come up. Thank you. Representative Obermuller, you have comments? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just based on uh, Don's presentation today, you know, it's apparent to me that uh, that school funding at close to current levels is not a matter of lack of capacity, the tax capacity to do so. Uh, the presentation shows that you know, modest middle of the road tax efforts by this state can solve a lot of our problems. You know, the statement uh, that we can't tax our way out is a statement about political realities and attitudes about public education rather than the tax capacity to fund our public education. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Go ahead, Senator, Ello, uh, Senator Rothfuss, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I appreciate those words from Senator Obermuller, or excuse me, Representative Obermuller. And I think the key concept, we, we talk a lot about how we have to cut education. We don't, we never have. We're choosing to cut education if we cut education. We are empowered to not cut education. We're the legislature. Uh, we have all the tools we need to raise education funding back to the levels they were five years ago if we choose to. And when we get done with the recalibration committee, I've been on a few of them with Senator Coe and with others, uh, it's pretty unlikely they're going to come back with a lower recommendation. Uh, the last one we saw was about $90 million above what we were spending. We didn't adopt that recommendation. I don't see anything in the preliminary reports that suggests this is going to be lower unless we want to find ways to cut the quality of education in Wyoming, which we can do. It's a choice. But again, I'll make it clear for my constituents on behalf of the people that I represent, we don't want any cut to education. We would, we would adopt these additional taxes. We would pay these taxes and we'd be proud to do it to ensure that the quality of education is maintained at its exceptional level that we currently enjoy. Representative Connolly. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I agree with Senator Raffis. And just kind of going back to Senator Coe's comment about the recalibration committee meeting next week, which again, I want to remind members of this committee that you are all invited to attend. And I believe even with salary to do so because it's so important that folks on the education committee um, understand what those discussions are. I have taken a look at that report, which is now out there for the meeting materials. No, it's, it's a heavy lift. It is 255 pages long and then with a yes. And then as typical, right, Senator Crow, for those of us who have served on that committee a couple of times, it is, it's enormous. And then there are several memos that follow it in terms of interpretation of some of the questions that the committee had. And while I do think that there will be a discussion about cuts, know that that report indicates some movement when it comes to the elements of the block grant, but it does not indicate that there should be fewer, for example, FTEs. And FTEs is what drives about 80% of the model. So to think that we're going to go through recalibration and come up with a dollar figure that is significantly less is, is naive, honestly. That's not what's going to happen. We're going to get some information about modernization, about looking at some of the needs of our districts and more importantly, our kids. But the reality is that dollar figure that will be associated with recalibration is not going to be much less. It just isn't. And I'm okay with that. I want us to think about, again, that modernization. I mean, there's going to be a discussion about pre-K, the absolute kind of recognition over and over again that high quality pre-K leads to positive outcomes for kids, something that we don't fund right now, right? We're gonna have discussions along those lines. So I too think that the information that we just received right now from Don Richards, is critically important for not only this committee, but for the recalibration committee, as well as the revenue committee. All of us, and that then becomes a good percentage of the legislature, needs to understand kind of our needs in terms of education, our obligations, and then how do we meet them? And honestly, in one page right in front of us, we have some of the solution. And I think it's on all of us all of those committees, which then is about a third of the legislature to act. And I would prefer that we don't kick the ball down to whatever committee we're not on, right, in order to solve that problem, that we on this education committee continue to look at, right, these kinds of figures, these kinds of solutions and in the same way that we're drafting a letter regarding how do we consolidate or think differently about our committee structure, we on the education committee, we think about our obligation for funding education. And that would be my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Go ahead, Senator Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I know you want to uh, continue to move on through the agenda, but uh, really appreciate the discussion. I want to uh, tip my hat to uh, uh, to the efforts to bring us this document. It's, it's one of the better ones I've seen over the past few years uh, to really outline, you know, where Wyoming stands. Uh, I just wanted to share, Mr. Chairman, um, some of us yesterday had a good conversation about school facilities and um, the reminder to all of us, uh, you know, on the meeting today, 2.7% of all we spend during a biennium in the general fund uh, usually is in, is in the category of major maintenance and, and school capital construction. So that's a big piece of, of all of this that I didn't want anyone to forget about. For example, yesterday, we talked about a couple of um, projects, one of which um, I'll just pick on a beautiful little community uh, up in your part of the world, Tensleep. Uh, that's a project that the executive branch has indicated should be taken off the board. Um, you know, that's a school that was built in the 1930s. Uh, we know that we're never going to be able to bus 10 sleep kids down to Moreland. We're always going to need a school there. And so 
the the alternative to going ahead and building that school is to simply say, well, we're just not going to build it. And the same thing goes with some of the renovations that we've got in mind. If you think about it, if you want to cut school capital construction, does that mean that we don't mitigate the situation over in Afton Star Valley, for example, uh, where we're assisting by building additional square footage to take care of uh, capacity needs? And what about Laramie One? You know, we've got we've got three or four parts of the world, Mr. Chairman, uh, that are going to require capacity consideration just on school capital construction. So I, I just say all of that because I, I think that that should be part of our thinking process. If we're going to if we're going to be serious about uh, cutting education, are we going to talk about uh, busing kids from Ten Sleep to Worland? because their facility just isn't up to snuff? Or what about things like consolidations and, and uh, administrative changes, uh, such as fewer superintendents and things? Then you start talking about the character of Wyoming and the ability of all those small communities out there to survive and thrive, attract new business. Um, so this is a big deal, Mr. Chairman, and um, I appreciate you letting me make a couple of comments. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just need to comment that, you know, I've been talking to a lot of folks this summer. And when I see, you know, we just got this sheet of paper and it was just recently characterized as a moderate tax increase. I can tell you that imposing an individual income tax, imposing a corporate income tax, increasing sales tax and increasing property tax across the board on residential, commercial and industrial properties is anything but um, our businesses are suffering. We have people unemployed. Wyoming's economy is struggling and will be for a while. And so to say that, you know, these dollars can simply be absorbed by working families, I just, I don't think that we can characterize these as anything as moderate. Um, this I think would, and I'd have to ask LSO, these go down as one of the most, I think the largest tax increase in Wyoming's history. And maybe I'm wrong, um, If you, but if you exclude severance and what our mineral industry has paid, I can't think of a time where Wyoming's paid more in taxes or been asked to pay more in taxes in one or couple of years in one sitting. And so I, I just, I don't view these as moderate at all. Go ahead, Representative Overeon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> in when you look at this schedule, it, it isn't uh, the fear mongering about now their legislature is going to impose all these taxes on us is what the, uh, opponents of public education and opponents of taxation used to scare the people of Wyoming. And this schedule here, if you give some thoughtful consideration to it, isn't suggesting that every one of these taxes be imposed to meet the objective. You can look at a few of these and solve a significant portion of our problem with implementation of a few of these ideas on here not every single one of these ideas necessarily. And there's an idea on that, that I've been working on on the corporate tax area that isn't even on here. Uh, so we're looking at various components of possible solutions and to have it destroyed by this fear mongering, I just, I just have to push back on that. I've heard this for four years and it's just getting really, really irritating to hear this from people that won't support a single tax of any sort at any level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we're going to wrap this up pretty soon here. Senator Office and then Senator Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and briefly, uh, you know, a lot of the tax suggestions that are used here were pretty well thought out. And speaking on the individual income tax and the corporate income tax, I'll restress that that $147 million on the individual income tax, uh, the first you don't even have to file under that bill. You don't even have to file until you've made 200,000 of a adjusted gross income. And then based on the constitutional exemptions, uh, the projections are that you wouldn't pay the first dollar until you've made over 300,000 of adjusted gross income. And if you've achieved that, congratulations, you're doing a great job. And we're not going to, to shatter your economic viability through that particular bill, you're going to sort things out pretty well. And it shows that there is a substantial 
amount of available taxation, tax capacity, as Representative Obermiller was talking about, in areas that won't hurt the people of Wyoming. And that's what we have to look for. But it's true, the fear mongering, the idea that, oh, we're going we're gonna to take this out of the pocket of somebody that can't afford food. Of course, that will shut the legislation down. Of course, that will kill this discussion. Of course, it will preclude us from funding education as we move forward. And it's done a tremendous job of that in recent years. Uh, we have organizations out there that spend all of their time and all of their dollars trying to seed those fears, uncertainty, and doubt. And they do an exceptional job of it because it's less expensive for those organizations to kill our legislation through this insidious behavior than it is for them to actually pay the taxes. It's just a return on investment for them. And they're, they're very good at it. So I hope we can take some hard looks at realistic approaches to taxation and revenue diversification that will help the state as we move forward, recognizing that we just haven't been successful at it in the past, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Ellis, please wrap hey, Mr. up. Chairman, my goal isn't to fear monger. My goal is just to communicate what I think a lot of working families are experiencing right now. And when we look at these numbers and we look at what our entire deficit is, we would have to impose all of these to start making a dent in covering the shortfall. So it isn't just let's pick one or two. What I'm hearing is we'll need all of this to cover the structural deficit. So, you know, fear mongering or not, I just, as a working person, it would be affected by all these taxes and looking at my community. Um, you know, you can classify it as you want to, but that's not the intention. It, it's trying to be real with where these dollars come from and who makes them. Okay, we could continue this conversation for quite some time. I understand. Let us move, I know, let us move ahead to the hazing school safety and hazing bill and see if we can get that done before lunch. It's, we got a half hour. Senator Chris Rothless, would you like to step up and tell us about your hazing bill? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 21 LSO 93, working draft four we have in front of us. Uh, this was the effort of a good working group that we put together. Uh, Representative Brown uh, co-chaired that little working group with me. We brought in uh, stakeholders from ASUW. Remember, they were the original proponents. They wanted some legislation brought. Uh, so we had uh, Riley, the, the president of ASUW involved, a few members from the university. We had members from the Community Council Commission and, and um, other representation from the community colleges. Uh, we had representation from K-12 from the Wyoming School Board Association and some uh, current and former uh, school superintendents and others involved and put together a, a good piece of legislation, in my view, that had a, a few core principles to it. The first concept is we, we weren't going to create a new felony or a new misdemeanor or new crimes or new punishment or anything along those lines. That was not the objective, so you won't see that in this bill. Uh, we really wanted a uniform definition as, as the key objective and a flexible definition, which would allow from a policy standpoint, school districts, the university and the colleges to have some flexibility in how they implement it and, and what policies they put in place, but ensure that everyone was reading from the same script when it came to what hazing is. And then the third key concept or, or central component was making sure that everyone had a policy in place relating to hazing. Uh, so that was the core that we arrived at through the working group. And then we spent some time brainstorming what it would include and, and what it would look like. And so it's a pretty straightforward, short piece of legislation that accomplishes those objectives. Uh, and and I, I think it's a good product that's, that's really ready to go, Mr. Chairman, as we work through the piece of legislation going on to page two, where we have the core of the bill, which is the definition of hazing. We looked at definitions from all across the country, from various policies, from the Wyoming High School Athletics Association, school boards and elsewhere. Uh, we picked out core pieces and we, we again made sure that it was simultaneously comprehensive, flexible, and included those key parameters that, that we saw as, as uniform and common among other definitions. So the definition comes down to that hazing means an intentional act or situation that is committed for the purpose of membership or affiliation with a group, team, or other person, and that causes embarrassment, harassment, or ridicule 
or risks emotional or physical harm to a student or employee. That encompasses a broad range of activities, but gets right at the, co the central core. And then finally, a key aspect in, in many pieces of legislation is that hazing can occur regardless of the person's willingness or consent to participate in the act or situation. So uh, it's a good, concise, and elegant definition that we're working with. And I'll note, this is in statute related to K-12. We're going to reference back to the same definition when we look at community colleges and the university, but we've just got it in one location within the education uh, title in our K-12 uh, statutes. Moving to page two and on to page three, the Education Committee will recall a few years ago, uh, we put in place some anti-bullying and harassment legislation. And it was good legislation that's been implemented by most school districts. And rather than creating any new standalone hazing enforcement or hazing policy legislation, we took a look at the harassment and bullying legislation and realized that with a few insertions, we could just amend statute and clarify that we wanted those policies to cover hazing as well. So we did that. And that's what you'll see on the next few pages is the addition of haze hazing into existing bullying and harassment and intimidation statutes. As we scroll down, let's see, that takes us through and on to halfway down page six, where we get into uh, obligations by the university, where the university shall provide government for the students that involves hazing, reflecting at a minimum the definition. And then on to page seven, the community college district boards shall adopt hazing policies, which at a minimum comport to that definition. You'll see that we get into page seven in section two, some required adoptions that they have to promulgate, the school districts have to promulgate rules and regulations, et cetera, or excuse me, policies uh, that comport with the definition and that uh, not later than the 31st of December, 2021, which is a, a point that we may discuss. This was one remaining point of contention for us to consider are these dates it was the only thing contentious left and, and what we should use as proper dates for when the rules are in place and when schools have adopted them. Uh, bill goes into effect July 1st, 2021. So I'll stop there and, and turn it over to uh, Co-Chairman of the Working Group, Representative Brown, to see what he would like to add and what I've missed. Representative Brown, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just say that Senator Office hit everything on this, but uh, one of the big issues um, I would say that we need to, as a committee, um, look at this particular bill is that last page and the, the promulgation of rules um, how long that will take, whether or not you have correct stakeholder input during a certain time frame. So um, we also could look at doing split, um, you know, effective dates on this. Um, There's quite a bit of discussion on that and whether or not certain school districts would be able to uh, promulgate these rules and, and have these standards available by uh, December 31st. If you look at that, we have it on December 31st of 2021. Well, that also seemed a little goofy to have um, a, a new rule or a new policy take effect in the middle of a school year. Um, most of these schools and school districts have these types of things printed out at the beginning of the school year. So they'll print out one portion and then December 31st, they'll have to go back and do it again. Um, this is a very similar discussion to what we had with um, with other school districts and, and smaller school districts in particular with uh, with. Um, computer science a few years ago and, and just not being able to get it done in time. And so it's not so much that we want to force this and make sure that this gets in there with, you know, just to make sure everybody's checking the box that we have a hazing policy, but it's to make sure that it's done correctly. Um, so that's one big portion. And then another big portion of the discussion that was in this that we, we did have a discussion of this in the past year's uh, legislation was that um, the the penal system coming into this, th this bill does not incorporate that. This is just a, a standard definition uh, with, you know, reference by uh, incorporation by reference back to the K through 12 area uh, for community colleges, as well as um, the university. Um, you know, and I think when we sat down and we looked at page two, going all the way back to the beginning of the bill, 
we had hazing and the definition there in hazing was was very encompassing and and was very um very broad to make sure that we had a, a good scope of what hazing truly meant and then what i will say is i had the opportunity to talk to the a few teachers and a few parents about this in particular over the past week or so um, and, and every single one of them has had a positive statement to say about this. And I, I've only received one negative statement about it. And it was, uh, why do we have to put this into law? That just seems ridiculous. And I agree with that statement that we do have to put stuff like this into law. Um, but everybody else was very, very um, accepting of this piece of legislation. And I would encourage a little bit of discussion around um, the adoption of uh, rules and, and whatnot. But um, I hats off to Senator Rothfuss. He, he was able to pin all these people down. Uh, we had the university in there. We had the community colleges and uh, Chris was able to uh, to herd cats like nobody I've ever seen before. So uh, kudos to him. And that's about all that we have on the on the bill. And I would open it up for discussion, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Any questions or comments to to Senator Rothfuss or Representative Brown? Anybody? If not, we'll move to the public comment period and, and see if Mr. Farmer would like to give us a comment on this bill. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brian Farmer, Wyoming School Boards Association. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Senator Rothfuss and Representative Brown for their work uh, with the uh, the task force, the, uh, the group they put together to uh, consider this. Uh, I suppose I am one of Representative Brown's cats um, who uh, was herded through the process. Um, you know, I guess I will um, say that we we really appreciated the opportunity to to be a part of this and uh, to offer comments. And and it's very difficult um, sometimes to speak uh, for all 48 uh, school districts. And so I, I will start uh, with what uh, we said last time you considered this. Uh, there are certainly some uh, who feel that this is unnecessary, uh, that the current uh, Safe School Climate Act already, uh, in, in its protection against intimidation, harassment, bullying, already prohibits this conduct. That being said, um, I do think that the addition of uh, hazing uh, provides some useful language, some clarity uh, around what uh, is uh, actually intended uh, as hazing. So uh, this does narrow in and specify, um, and if it's already being done, uh, it's, it's, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be a concern or a problem. If it's not being done, uh, this is something that districts do take seriously. When we uh, visited with our, our membership, they certainly said, you know, this is kind of conduct that uh, should not be tolerated, uh, should be prohibited, and, and so school districts um, do uh, take this seriously. So again, if you hear from some uh, that it's not necessary, that should not be uh, new to you. Um, that's something we said before, but, but, but we do think this is useful. Um, I do think that this legislation uh, is beneficial and it, it, you did exactly what we asked you to do by putting it into uh, the Safe School Climate Act and combining it with legislation that already exists. So in talking with, uh, with uh, districts about the uh, creation of policy and the adoption of policy, um, that looks to be um, a, an easy enough task uh, to insert words uh, into the policy. What Representative Brown talks about is uh, certainly worth considering. Um, it talks about an implementation um, and, and uh, under the current uh, page seven, Section 2, uh, line 18, not later than December 31st. The reason why that will cause concern for some is because in the existing statute, uh, it says uh, that districts, each school, school board shall include the policy adopted by a school board district pursuant to this section in a publication of the comprehensive rules, procedures, and standards of conduct for schools of a school district in each school's uh, handbook. Um, and, and then that it be included in professional development as well. And so a mid-year inclusion um, of uh, a new handbook and a new professional development program may cause uh, some challenge for some districts. And, and so uh, that's where, um, if, if, again, 
back to what I said at the beginning, if it's already being delayed and this provides, or it's already being provided, this provides greater clarity, um, this will help to refine a policy. This will help to clarify what we can do um, to prohibit this conduct. Uh, and, and districts will take those steps over the course of this. This is not later than uh, December 31st, or if you choose to move that back uh, for another school year. The reason you can't really move it up uh, is because just prior to that, um, the Department of Education is going to develop some resources. So as WDE develops some resources around this, and then the backwards process for a school district is uh, typically three readings of a policy. So for a board who, uh, who meets monthly, that's really a 90-day calendar, um, so a three-month uh, implementation uh, for the adoption of new policy. And, and so uh, starting a September 1st uh, of, uh, of the 2021 school year um, is, is uh, potentially challenging uh, because there will not yet be WDE resources uh, and districts would have to start immediately uh, on the policy process. And I think it's important to engage parents in this, uh, to engage community members, uh, to think about are there other things that individual districts want to add to their policy. Certainly those districts who have experienced instances may want to be more specific uh, about conduct that they want to prohibit. Uh, so I guess uh, overall, uh, I want to say that we are supportive of this uh, legislation. We appreciate uh, the input from uh, the uh, working group. Uh, Senators, uh, Senator Rothfuss and Representative Brown uh, certainly did a nice job of considering all of the diverse perspectives uh, as they brought this together. Uh, and, and really, I just share the concerns uh, from my membership for your consideration. Thank you, Brian. Do you have a suggested date that you would like to see at uh, line 18 on page seven? Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, I think uh, it could easily be uh, September 1st, uh, 2022, um, and then you avoid um, any potential conflicts. Um, those that are able to implement it sooner certainly will do so. Those that have a problem have uh, uh, the ability to go beyond that uh, mid-school year implementation. So that would, that would be the um, safest date. Thank you. Senator Landon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. You asked the same question that, that I intended to ask. Uh, my only uh, follow-up to that, uh, Brian, would be uh, you had mentioned that there are publication dates and uh, now it's mostly electronic, I assume, but if there are uh, hard print dates, we may have to back that up just a little bit, um, given the language. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? If we go September 1st, for example, uh, they don't have to adopt until September 1st. Um, that doesn't give them time to, to include that in their in their publications, does it? Go ahead, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Landon, that's a good point. You know, July 1st of uh, 2022 would, um, you know, afford that printing and publication time. Uh, so that may be a wiser uh, date than September 1st. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that would be uh, a better better option. And you're right about the electronic publication versus the uh, print publication. Um, but I think uh, when you're talking, the area that this is most likely to impact a K-12 district uh, is going to be with your activities uh, and athletics. And a lot of those programs are developing um, the handbooks, uh, the parent-student uh, handbook at the beginning of the school year um, provided in paper form uh, to the student athletes, uh, to the uh, members of the student body. And, and that's, uh, again, for the parents that may not have access to um, the online versions uh, of documents, or even for a parent that finds it difficult uh, to find a policy on a website. Senator Rothfuss, you had a question? Oh, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to say actually the same thing about the July uh, 1st, whether that would be acceptable rather than uh, the September that Senator Landon uh, asked. So um, 
that's that's answered. The, the other question I would have, I, I guess, uh, and when we were talking about it in our working group, um, if we're moving, if we if we choose as a committee to select July 1st, 2022 as that B paragraph date, it would be reasonable to give the department a little longer for the model, maybe not a, a tremendous amount longer, but that's a little bit of a short fuse as well. So contemplating November 1st instead of September 1st might be a rational alternative. And this is exactly the kind of discussion we wanted to have with the committee to work this out. Uh, we, we were perfectly open to all options. We just wanted to make sure that we were getting it as soon as was practicable. Yes. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you. Just a quick question. I might have missed it. Does any other, does any school district of Wyoming already have hazing, hazing language in their policies? Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Chairman um, and Senator Ellis, at your last meeting, um, we provided a memo to the committee um, summarizing uh, a uh, response to that question. Many of our districts believe that their current uh, policy around bullying uh, and intimidation um, harassment incorporates this behavior. Um, as to whether or not the word hazing is specifically in there, um, we didn't ask that. We asked if they thought that their policy uh, prohibited the conduct described in the contemplated definition, uh, and the vast majority said yes. Their current policy already prohibits that behavior. Okay. Representative Flintner, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Brian, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. I just have a question for you on page seven, section two, lines 13 and 14, where it talks about teacher preparation program standards. What, what does that look like, teacher preparation? With, if, if we were to add clarity by the inclusion of hazing, um, just what are your thoughts on that, please? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Flintner, can you uh, point me again to the page as I toggle back and forth? I want to be sure I'm responding to the right section. It's Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, sorry, Brian. It's page seven, section two, lines 13 and 14, where it talks about teacher preparation program standards on the identification and prevention of hazing. Got it, Brian. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, that's a, a question best addressed by the Wyoming Department of Education, uh, but in their rules, um, they do have uh, rules uh, that identify um, uh, teacher preparation uh, and, and what, what's necessary uh, there. So I, I, I can't tell you I'm familiar uh, off the top of my head with any change that would be necessary in WDE rules. Um, but again, giving them sufficient time to go through any rule promulgation um, would, would certainly be helpful. Uh, guesstimating you, you pass this uh, in March, uh, and if you give them until November, uh, that certainly would, that would give them time, or heck, give them until December 31st, 2021. Uh, that way they can go through uh, any change to rule promulgation. Um, but at this point, I don't know that I'm the right person to answer that. Uh, because I, I, I don't uh, know that I've looked at those rules recently. Thank you. Anybody else questions for Brian? All right, not appearing. Mr. Chairman, just a yes, quick question. Brian, do you think if we if we made this not effective July 1st, as this was part of the discussion um, in our original work group as well, if we made this effective immediately and didn't push it back for, you know, a, a full other year, um, you know, if we made this effective immediately, do you, do you anticipate that some of the school districts would start, start on this immediately just to get this portion out of the way starting at the beginning of the next school year? Or do you think that we keep it where it's at and just let it go through? What, what's your thoughts on that? Go ahead, Brian. Mr. Chairman, Representative Landon, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Representative Brown, um, I'm starting that and you guys are gonna do that for the rest of the day now. Um, Representative Brown, um, what, what will happen uh, is as soon as you pass it, many districts are gonna start working on it, regardless of what you have in the effective uh, section. They're going to then balance that against what else they have on their plate. 
who would have known that this last spring the pandemic would be front and center? Many things did take a back seat. Um, if they are uh, getting toward the end of the year, uh, traditionally March is going to be around the beginning of your assessment window. Um, they may be focused on that then uh, into graduation. Um, so depending on the workload of the district, the other things that they're considering, um, they're going to, th this goes in the hopper as soon as it's passed. Uh, and then they balance it against their other priorities. Um, because you have contemplated it now, we've already begun drafting a model policy for our districts, uh, and that will be ready to go for them uh, should, should this legislation pass, uh, probably uh, shortly after you having passed it. Anybody else? All right. We have one more public comment, and it's, yes, go ahead, Chairman Coe. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, just, just a brief update on Mr. Kosseblun, who's going to present now on why uh, he wanted to be on our agenda. He's he's up here in Park 6 to talk about Jason Flat Act and potentially some adjustments that we could make to that. And he promised a short presentation. We just couldn't fit him in the agenda because we consolidated the meeting down from two days to one. So that's why you see Mr. Kosseblun. So it will not be about necessarily hazing. I suggested this is a good time frame for him to come on in public comment and talk to the committee. So that's that's why we're doing this now. That's right. So Daniel, it's up. You're up. You want to talk to us about Jason Flat Act? I've got a, a briefing from you just very shortly, but go ahead and tell everybody what you're thinking. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, and and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, um, Thanks for responding to my emails, both you and, and Senator Coe uh, were so gracious and, and getting back to me immediately uh, with this topic. And, and it, the hazing topic actually directly relates to what I wanted to talk about, which is, which is teen suicide. Um, so I'm the, my name is Dan Kosaboon. I'm the school psychologist here at, in Park Six at, uh, Six at Cody High School. I've uh, been here for the past eight years. Um, what I'm here to do today is to ask the committee to amend the Jason Flat Act to include suicide prevention and awareness training to all students in Wyoming grade in Wyoming grades six through 12. Uh, the rationale for that, um, when we're looking at the research and when we're looking at the data coming out, um, even up as recently as yesterday, um, our numbers have increased in, in terms of completed suicides in Wyoming. Uh, from 2016 to 2019, we've gone from 20.8 completed, completed suicides for age groups 15 through 24 per 100,000 to 36.3 per 100,000. And this is since the Jason Flat Act has come out. Um, the Wyoming health rankings that came out in 2020 uh, stated that the suicide that suicide was the leading cause of death uh, for our age groups 15 to 24 in Wyoming. And when you look at the research, when you study this topic out, what you'll find there's a multitude of research studies out there that will show that teenagers in this age group are go 80 to 90 percent of the time are going to tell a friend about their suicidal ideation and their suicidal intent. However, most of that time they will not tell an adult. And that's a big problem for us because right now Jason Flat, the, the act is, is uh, compelling us to train the adults and the staff in the building. But our contention is that we're missing the most critical part of the population and that and that's the kids, that's the students. They are going to know when their student, when their friend is either thinking about suicide or is actively suicidal, but met much of the time it's not that information is not reaching the adults because they're not sure what to do or how to react to that information. And so again, if you go back to the literature. Um, when students are given the proper suicide prevention training. It has been shown to reduce suicidal behaviors, including reducing the number of completed suicides. Um, if they're properly trained, it also increases the knowledge and skills in making appropriate referrals when they are approached by one of their friends 
who is either thinking about suicide or is actively suicidal. And the research is very clear about that. But yet the majority of our kids in Wyoming are not getting this type of training. Um, so that, that's, that's our main points in terms of why we want to do this. Now, anecdotally, I can tell you, um, unfortunately, we've had three cases of suicide, completed suicide in the three years that I've been at the high school here in Cody. And in two of those three cases, after you know, we're doing the counseling and we're seeing the kids, I had multiple students in two of the three cases tell me, they said, Dr. Dan, they told me that they were gonna do that and I didn't say anything. They just didn't know what to do. They thought it was, they were helping a friend by keeping a secret. And that's not okay. They didn't know better. And now they're living with the guilt that, that often comes after something like that with, I wish I would have done something more. They just didn't know what to do. And I think it's our job to, to train them in what to do. We have to. Um, I can also tell you in the first three days since we have started school, Monday, we at the high school have completed seven, a full seven suicide risk evaluations since Monday. That has never happened. And yes, it's clearly this is a case, is, they warned us about this, that this was going to happen because of COVID. And it's, I'm here to tell you, it is happening. Now, I'm here to tell you the Jason Flat Act worked because of those seven cases, five of those cases were brought to us by teachers. And in fact, those kids were thinking about suicide. They weren't active, they didn't have to go to a hospital, but they're thinking about it every day. And now that we know because the teachers were trained properly, they brought them to us, now we have a package of care surrounding those kids to make sure that they're okay. And so that's a great example of how the Jason Flat Act worked and, and we've never needed it more than we do right now uh, because the kids are in crisis um, and, and it's happening before our eyes. And in my eight years, never have I seen that. Uh, but we're being faced with it. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that districts throughout our state and, and, and school districts throughout our nation are facing the same thing right now. Um, so that's why we're asking the committee to, to bring this forward, to change the Jason Flat Act because these kids have to be taught how to respond when they see it because they're gonna see it before we do. And we need it brought to us so that we can, we can help the kids and get them the support that they need. Um, I can tell you that prevention funds already exist on the county level. Um, what's going on right now, uh, work, we're working with Cody Regional Health, um, Wendy Morris. Um, she is bringing a team into our high school and they are going to train every single one of our kids with suicide prevention and awareness. In addition to that, um, every single one of our school psychologists and school counselors will also be trained by her staff so that we can deliver these services to every single kid, grade six through 12, every single year that they're here. It has to happen. So that by the time they graduate from our system, they're gonna bring this out into the community and, and be better prepared uh, as an adult even whether they recognize it within themselves, within a friend, a family member, or a coworker, this is going to stick with them for the rest of their lives if we train them properly. Um, in terms of support, I've, I've already met with um, the Wyoming Psychological Association, the Wyoming School Psych Association, um, the National Association of Licensed Clinical Social Workers, the Wyoming Division, the Wyoming School Counselors Association. My colleague has met, she, uh, Jelena Freitas, she couldn't be here today, but she has met with the Wyoming Nurses Association. We've met with the Park County Suicide Prevention Coalition, the Natrona County Suicide Prevention Coalition, the Cody High School Student Council, Cody High School National Honor Society, and Youth for Justice. And that's just the beginning. It's, it's building and it's building and it's building. And all of these folks have agreed to give us formal support. They're, whole, they're willing to have votes on their um, executive boards in favor of this. 
and are willing to testify if need be that this is a good thing to do. Um, so with the, the Student Council and the National Honor Society, um, they're taking it up as one of their causes this year and they're going to get in touch with student councils and the National Honor Society associations across the state of Wyoming. And so I think it's going to build very, very quickly uh, on the student level. And I think it's important to, that, the, that the kids are saying that in fact they want this because when you lose a friend, it, it's, it's a devastating thing. Um, so that, that's, that's my plea. That's, that's what I'm asking uh, the body to do is to, to consider amending the FLAT Act, the Jason FLAT Act to include suicide awareness and prevention training for every single student in Wyoming grades six through 12. Um, so that's it. Um, I really appreciate you giving me the time and, and thank you Senator Coe and Representative Northrop for uh, guiding me through this process. I wouldn't have been here if you guys didn't respond like you did and gave me the support that you did. So I really appreciate it. And here, here's what I'm gonna tell you. I'll leave you with this last thing. And, and I mean this sincerely. If we take this up and we do it and it passes, if it saves one student's life, one, one, then it, it, then it was well worth it. And I mean that sincerely. So that's, that's what I'll leave you with. And uh, I just thank you for your time. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Representative Pete Breen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Daniel, thank you for bringing this to light. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't um, make known that I'm, I'm concerned about more encroachment upon the academic time for the teachers in grades six through 12. But I would ask you, do you know in the existing Jason Flat Act Foundation videos, and there's an array of them, I sat through quite a few. Does this topic get addressed in an existing video from the foundation itself? Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, It sounds like a nod. No, not, not that. I'm, but but again, I haven't watched every video, so I have to I have to put that caveat in there as well. Yeah, okay. it's it's something that it it. I don't think most districts are doing it right right now. Um, there's three th three schools in Wyoming who are undertaking suicide prevention in a very serious way, and they're they're employing what's called the uh, signs of suicide or. Um, that, that uh, a program similar to that, but, but that's about it. Um, and and it, it's a serious enough public health problem that I think we need to address it because they're gonna find out way before we do. And these cases just aren't coming to us like they need to. Representative Freeman, you had a question? More of a comment than a, than a um, question. I think that several of you were around when I found out of the, the suicide of my cousin during session and that, that hit me pretty hard. Um, the other thing that happened is I had a former student uh, who lost a son um, uh, to suicide also. And it's, I, I'm getting to the point where I don't want to get on Facebook because these two women uh, are, are suffering in public. And when they come up right next to each other, which happens about once a week, it's, it's, it's difficult to handle. Um, two things. One, uh, I think Daniel's absolutely right. Kids are gonna find out before, before teachers. In my uh, alternative high school career, God knows how many times I, I, I had a student come to me that said, uh, uh, so and so is thinking of suicide, and um, and I escorted. Uh, first, I talked to the student, and ex escorted the student directly to the counselor because that was above my ability to uh, um, to handle that situation. Um, students, unless you have a personal connection with teachers, 
they're more than likely not going to come to the teacher with that kind of secret. And, um, and then, um, you know, you, you have to, uh, you know, at an alternative school, I, I had it pretty easy because we had that personal contact. I also taught in a large high school. Uh, I wouldn't have been as effective as, as what they were going on with that. Um, Representative Piperina is absolutely right. It's another thing to add to uh, um, uh, to teaching. I think that it's a public health crisis, and I think that uh, we we should add that little bit to it because it has such profound um, consequences. Um, that's a big proponent to the the Jason flight. Um, the Jason and I losing the name right now. Uh, and I think that is absolutely a good thing. Um, the implementation of that I think has been spotty. I've seen some school districts that have implemented it uh, very well, the Jason Flat Act. Uh, and they've added to it to where they, they had some meaningful uh, uh, consequences. Um, I've seen other school districts that uh, have not done it very well. Have made the uh, the video available for for teachers to do on their own time, and they don't take it seriously. And I think that that's a travesty. Uh, I'd be willing to work with uh, whoever would want to to uh, uh, to to get students more involved. But it comes back, and I think that everybody on this committee has heard me say this before: is is my wife taught in a in an elementary school um, for 40 years. In the last three or four years of her, her um, teaching career, she had second graders. She, didn't, she taught kindergarten, but I was a good friend of the counselors. We had second graders that were seriously thinking about suicide. So even the sixth grade, you know, is, is it, is something that we could debate if we wanted to. The other thing that, um, that that's more difficult with um, with students is is that they come with a whole range of social skills, and for many of those students, talking about suicide in the sixth grade uh, would be particularly. Um, uh, appropriate, but some come from houses that don't talk about it, that don't have the background and to confront them with, with uh, one, defining what suicide is and then how you prevent it would be very tragic to them. So any kind of, of um, education has to, uh, be aware of that fact and, and compensate for that fact. But I think that this is a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna to move to Representative Paxton and let him comment first, Daniel. Go ahead, Jerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wondered if, we, if we're if we listening to this testimony, if we have a failure in the in the Safe to Tell program. Uh, originally, when we, when we put that out, that was one of the, the very important uh, aspects of that is that safe to tell program provides an opportunity for kids to notify someone that there was something happening so i want to know if there is a failure in that program go ahead chairman co yeah thank you mr chairman just to respond to representative paxton uh, you know dan and i've talked about that this this is meant to supplement uh, and enhance the safe to tell program. And um, which by the way is, you know, amazing results. I really think safe to tell has really been a, a home run for us you know, legislatively. So I guess I defer to Dan on that, but it's meant to supplement the safe to tell program. Go ahead, Dan, let's hear from you. It, that is true. This would be in addition to and we do get reports through safe to tell um, it's a little bit safer because it is anonymous and the kids don't have to come forward so they don't feel as much like they're betraying a student or a, 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 their friend's trust um, 
but again, they need the training for this because oftentimes the person who is actively suicidal will make them promise not to tell anybody. And we need to dispel that myth and get rid of it and fight it with everything that we have. Because that's really what's going on is they, they confide in their peer and then their peer makes them promise. And so then if, if they feel like if they're, if they're going to tell someone, they, they betray that promise. And if I could just go back to the, um, you know, the question about um, school, the, the classroom time. That's an excellent point. And what we've, what we've kind of, when we think that through, when we talk about evidence-based programs, there's, there's a plethora of evidence-based programs out there. And the school districts in each school, we're not saying you have to do this program or that program. What we're saying is you have to do something that's evidence-based, that, that is clinically shown to reduce suicide completions and increase reports of suicidal behavior, thoughts, and intentions. And there's different things that you can do out there and it has to be left to each school and each district to make those decisions to choose something that fits within their culture of that school and within their schedule and time frame and, and, and ability to deliver it. Uh, so that is a very, it's a point well taken and we have considered it. And so what we're doing in, in, in uh, the high school here is Wendy's team is going to come in and she has five um, uh, trainers and we've picked first block. And so her five trainers are going to go into each one of our first blocks. So one day she'll go into five different classes with her trainers. And then the next day she'll go into a different uh, first block classes. And then we're going to just run that through uh, until every single uh, student in the high school gets trained. And that way the teachers only give up 60 minutes of time because that, that's what worked for us. And then, you know, but that might not work for another school, for another high school or middle school. And so we're not proposing a very specific um, intervention, just that it is an evidence-based intervention and there's enough out there that a school district can grab one access some of the county help that's out there and then tailor it to meet their needs without giving, without putting too much burden at all on the teachers or taking up financial resources or, or anything like that. Okay, Representative Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if it's appropriate, I'd like to make a motion. And that motion would be to have a bill draft for us to evaluate at our next meeting. But it would be somewhat conceptual because I'm not sure that expansion of the Jason Flat Act as it exists right now, where it's in a statute regarding the duties of the Board of Trustees is the best place for it. But another portion of our statute, which would be 219 dash one is where we put child sexual abuse prevention instruction. And so that might be a better place for it, but I would like us to continue having the discussion and leave it to the discretion of LSO about where it would be best placed in terms of our statute so we can continue this discussion at our next meeting and make a decision whether or not to bring forth a bill as the education committee to kind of do the expansion that Mr. Casaboon is, is encouraging us to do. Uh, Senator Coe, is it not true that uh, Cody Youth for Justice is also pushing on this? Uh, yes, that is uh, uh, correct. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, Youth for Justice is, you know, taking this on as well through through Deb White, who, you know, Dan knows quite well. Okay. Representative Freeman. I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Senator Ellis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, remind me, that's a permissive statute. It's a may, not a shall. Is that correct, Representative Connolly? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that, that is correct. So the one that just thinking about a place for it to go, um, it, it might be better suited in 21-9-10 whatever um, versus 21-3-110 where it is right now. But the one that exists for sexual abuse prevention is permissive. Um, I think we would decide whether or not we would want it to be a may or a shall, but it would need to be its own section. Go ahead, Senator. Mr. Chairman, I am, and I don't know, not, this is not for 
this moment, but at some point, if we're looking at that area of the statute, it would be good to get an update to see if any school district has in fact done that sexual abuse prevention. My guess is of our 48 districts, maybe one or two, if we're lucky, my guess is more like zero, but I'd be curious to know that Mr. Chairman. All right, I'll make a note. We have a motion on the floor. Any more discussion? Mr. Chairman, you have Senator Rothfuss. I didn't see him. Thank you, Senator. Go ahead, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, where am I on your screen? <laughs> <laughs> You're on the left. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to say that uh, this is an issue that our high school uh, youth group that, that has been lobbying and has been working with us on legislation over the years is also passionate about. So I would expect a strong response from our community youth and their engagement as well if we work this legislation. So I'm certainly going to support it. Anybody else? All right, we'll proceed to vote on the motion. All those in favor, or I guess raise your hand. Those opposed? Well, it does pass, but there's four against. Okay. Any more public comment? Any more public comment? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Representative. I would Collins. just like to um, kind of volunteer myself, and I'd like to volunteer Mr. Casaboon to kind of work with LSO at the kind of the possibilities for the legislation, um, because I think there are a couple of options and choices as we go forward and to see how he and maybe his groups have been thinking about it. All right, good. No more public comment. We're going to adjourn for lunch and come back and pick this bill up and work it after. Mr. Chairman, quick question for you. So I just want to make sure that that is, um, we're doing that um, outside of the, we're not, we're not including anything to do with that with hazing. This was a completely separate bill draft and 100% um, different. We're going to be picking up the hazing bill after lunch. Is that yeah. right? Correct. Yep. We'll pick up hazing. Chairman Cole will pick up hazing after lunch and we'll work the bill. See what we do with it. Mr. Chairman? Yes, go ahead, Representative Flinter. Thank you. What time are we back in? 12, um, 123. Okay, do we need a full hour? We don't need a full hour. We'll go. How about, um, I'm good at one o'clock. Everybody else good at one o'clock? No. No. One o'clock. So, or one, 130 sounds great, or 123, Mr. Chairman. 115 will compromise. All right. I might be late, Mr. Chairman. Okay. See you around then. Bye. 115. Yep. Well, till then, we're adjourned. Thank you.